Skywalker episode three, touching on episode three, Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah we just rewatched it. Yeah. What do you think? It's um. Uh, it's uh, it's a very fun film. It's a very fun film, in my opinion. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty bad. It's yeah, pretty I, I I kind of stand by what I said before we watched it. Which is that I think it's the worst prequel. No. Nah. Clones is probably worse, but... Clones is the worst. Every every time we've watched one of these, I've been like, it's so much worse than I remembered. Yeah. This one... This one has a lot of stuff that I used to think was good. And now I think is completely horseshit. Like, Grievous. I mean, we'll get into it, but... Everything I used to think was... Like, I, I saw this film when I was, what, 10 years old? I could once, at one time, probably say every single line from this movie by heart. I loved this movie when I was a kid. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Oh, this is the only prequel that I watched multiple times when yeah. I was a kid. I remember always renting it. Oh, yeah. At the, at the video store. Like, always rented this this movie because I really liked it. And it wasn't just the movie. Like, I had the Lego set. I played the video game, which has deleted scenes from the movie in it. I remember a friend of me, mine... Had the game I really, really like it. The game's good. The game's actually like surprisingly good. It's like a um, it's like a full scale beat 'em up. Yeah, yeah. And you and like, like alternate between Anakin and Obi Wan, and they have different power sets. And... Yeah, and they had like different uh, endings. Yes, you, you could you could go into the evil ending, and Anakin kills Palpatine and Obi Wan and Obi Wan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I remember the funny thing about that game is that you could use the lightning power on the, yeah. in the first mission. With Anakin. Oh, yeah, because he's the, already... Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> he figured it out from when he got lightninged by Dooku. Yeah. Um, so this film comes out in 2005. As we were discussing before, an incredibly good year for movies. Peter Jackson's King Kong comes out that year. Batman Begins comes out. Madagascar. What else came out in 2005? I feel like it was a really good year. I mean, um, this was the highest grossing film of the year. War of the Worlds comes out. War of the Worlds is pretty good. It's a, it's a good first half of a movie. Yeah. As soon as they meet Tim Robbins, it kind of stops being good. Yeah, it has... But Munich also comes out, which is a fantastic movie. Sin City. Brokeback Mountain. Oh, Charlie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Factory. Walk yeah, the yeah. Line. Yeah, it was a good year for dramas. It's Pride so and Prejudice, right. Match Point, Lord of War, Constant Gardner. Oh, Sky Constant. High. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Best movie. Man, Sky High, is, Sky High is awesome. The Island? Wow. So Spielberg's having a huge year. Yeah. Because he produced The Island. That's his first Michael Bay that he produces. Hitch, robots, Fantastic Four. Damn. Isn't it? Isn't it weird to think that Fantastic Four and Batman Begins come out the exact same year? Jesus Christ, is that true? I yeah. never thought about and that. And Constantine. Wow, hanging in there, man. Suriana. Oh man. So apparently, um, the new Doolittle movie, which is directed by Stephen Gagan, who directed Suriana, apparently, according to crew members, it's like really, really. It was a very messy production. And another director, I can't remember who, was called... I think it was Jonathan Liebsman, was brought in to direct something like 20% of the movie. Mm. And Stephen Kagan apparently didn't want to pre-visualise any of the scenes with the animals. So, apparently it's just an absolute nightmare. And, um, yeah, it seems... it. The, put it this way, the fact that they're releasing it in January, and it's meant Ooh. to be this big studio movie... Ooh, January releases, I'm not... Nah. No, not for blockbusters. They normally are like... That's, that's the month of the year that they dump their films. Like, yeah. Like, Assassin's Creed came out in January. Yeah, but Assassin's Creed was just a sleeper hit waiting to happen. Yeah. I watched... Literally yesterday, I, I've never seen it. I've heard things about it. It's awful. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard you tell... It's directed by Justin Kurzel, who yeah. is like a huge Australian director. It's, who, he's an Australian director and I'm like... I don't apparently like, he's pretty good, right? I don't like his films. I don't think I've seen any of his films. You haven't seen Snowtown? Nope. You haven't seen uh, Macbeth? Nope. 
like I've seen Snowtown and Macbeth. Um, Snowtown is one of the most shocking films I've ever seen in terms of tone. And it's very oppressive in that way that a lot of Australian kind of shock horror movies are. Mm. Like it falls very much into that camp of um, Saw for me. Where it's v- the almost original exploded. Saw? Or... No, sorry, Wolf Creek, Wolf Creek. Oh, Wolf yeah, Creek. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 Wolf Creek. Um, where it's almost exploitative, like the punishment that they give you as an audience watching people do these awful things. Okay, interesting. Um, and unlike something like Chopper, which I showed you very recently, it doesn't yep. have that beautiful bit of reprieve, which Chopper does so well, is like, laugh, 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 stop laughing. And I love that about Chopper, it's so clever. Um, and yeah, I, I, I put on Assassin's Creed's um, parkour scene... There's barely any parkour. No, nope. in the whole film. No, nope. it's 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 and and the only parkour there is you can't really t- tell what's going on. That's nuts. It keeps like, it's such a frantic frantic film. It keeps cutting constantly. You know, a scene it's... that visually reminds me a lot of Assassin's Creed what? with the action is um weirdly that scene in Aquaman, where they're like running across the roofs and like, oh yeah, like, I think it. I told you after we watched the film. Oh, like, that that was like what an Assassin's Creed. That was Creed, like yeah. that's what Assassin's Creed to look like. Yeah, totally. I mean, maybe more dramatic. A bit more dramatic and um, yeah it's a bit like that like going around buildings I mean it should be that Casino Royale chase but set in you know ancient Italy yeah set in ancient yeah. Italy which yeah. will make it really, really or, cool. or um, Venice because that's the coolest setting for many of the games which ones have you played because I've only played oh, one two you've played all except Syndicate wow I didn't finish Origin because it was right after I played or- or Odyssey and I was a bit tired is of Odyssey good it. people say it's good I love Odyssey might be one of my favorite games of last year. You, your choice. I really what? liked it. I really, really liked it. Biggest problem, biggest problem in that in that game. Yeah. Is that uh, is the XP mm. system is I heard horrendous. This. Yeah, I heard that. You it's... need the XP boost. Right. That's which nuts. costs a bit of money. And if it wasn't for that, I would say it's one of my favorite. Oh, did games. you pay for it? I got it because the <gasps> game no! was unplayable otherwise. That's I, I got, Well, I got the game on, on a sale. Oh, okay. I got, I got the game cheaper, so I was like, okay. I'm How much did you end up spending on the game to finish it? Well, it's just... No, you, How much you, is the XP boost? You get a speed boost and it lasts you uh, the whole game. But how much did it cost? It's like... It was like... Not $10, $7. Are you serious? Yeah. Otherwise, the game... The, the progression of the game is, is completely ruined. And that's what that's what completely screws up the game. Yeah, wow. Apart from that, it would have been one of my favorite video games. It's, that's I nuts. really like it. That's so nuts. I, like, I'm trying to think if I've ever spent money on DLC that wasn't like a map pack when I was, you know, 15. That's, like, the state of video games right now is so fucked. Um, anyway, Star Wars. Star Wars video games. What is Star Wars? Remember when Lucas... This is, this is something we're going to get into with the Disney films. But, like, the worst thing... I think the first thing that really tipped me off that the Disney reign of owning Star Wars was going to be really tough for fans of Star Wars was when um, LucasArts game division got shut down and people like Pandemic lost their lost their games. Like, Star Wars oh, Battlefront thought, 3 thought, was like a month off being completed. I thought Pandemic was closed before that. No, Pandemic was still open. No, I'm thinking of Free, no, Ra- Free no, Radical. No, no, no. Free Radical yeah, was still open. Free Radical were developing Battlefront 3. No, uh, Battlefront 3 wasn't nowhere near completion when Disney took over. I've heard that it was close. No, it was, you're talking you're thinking about Star Wars thirteen thirteen. Yeah, thirteen thirteen. That, was that way is close the though. game that was really close to being released. Yeah. And then they sat it down. But that was that was Crazy. a game that had a huge problem in development. Yeah, because Lucas changed it to a Boba Fett story, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, like they it had nothing to do with him and then they he changed it mid game, which was the same as the Darth Maul game. Wasn't originally meant there to be a, about Darth Maul. There was a Darth Maul. Yeah, you can see gameplay of it online. It looks kind of wicked. It's like a God of War style um, slasher. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, Revenge of the Sith. Um, where which cinema did you see it in? Do you remember? Jesus Christ, uh, in Spain. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Did you have a go to? Oh my That's god, I what? have a story. Oh, on good. The day I saw the uh, Revenge of the Sith. I do too. I think. Yeah. It's it, my story is pretty interesting. Yeah, tell me, tell okay. Me. Yeah. So. I saw the the Phantom Menace on theaters, like I said yeah. last time, and then I saw I saw the Clones, and I fell asleep through it, yeah, because it was so boring. And then I remember when uh, this movie came out, when uh, Revenge of the Sith came out. Yeah, my sister went to see it like the first week that it was out, or like mm. the first weekend or something. 
and she was telling me about it and like she was telling me about how much she liked it and all, and all that and I was I started to get really hot, excited for it so we decided to go the next weekend and I was on my holiday in a holiday place in Spain in like this small town called Cullera yeah. which is like in the coast of Spain of Valencia and we we booked tickets in like this uh, on Saturday or something for like the afternoon screening right I was really really excited to see this film like I couldn't stop thinking about it yeah. I remember before it I had a fr- uh, I had a friend o- uh, I think I, I had a friend over right and like we kept talking about Star Wars constantly oh, yeah. like, we, like of course as kids you always talk about your favorite franchises right and, and as adults apparently yes as adults as well yes and that day on the beach, I got stung by a, uh, by a venomous. You sure is fish. Yes, I have my. I have what my fish scar. was it? Uh holy shit! You've never shown me that. Nope, I have a lot of scars. Uh, <laughs> it was. I got stung uh, by this venomous, uh, venomous fish, right? And I don't, I don't really know the species. But yeah, I know what it looks like, but uh, I got stung. There's no. There's barely any po- uh, poisonous or venomous fishes in Spain. Right. There's barely any. It's yeah. not like Australia, which is filled with them. Yeah. Okay. There's and I've never any. ever been stung by anything I've venomous. I've never heard of any ven- dangerous fish in the Mediterranean. The one time I've been bitten by a venomous animal was in Fiji, which was a hornet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I couldn't walk. A whole right. Day. Oh On my the day, God. I couldn't walk. And I was really worried I was going to miss the screen. <laughs> the film. And I... And I <sighs> I had to like, and I, by the end of, by the time that it was the time of the screening, I could actually walk and I was like trying Hobbling to make it. into the theater. Yes. And there was. Uh, you were like Anakin were like, trying to climb out of the lava. Yeah. And there were like a lot of stairs up to the, to the theater. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. So the day I saw it run to the seat, I got stung by a fish that was trying to stop me from watching the film. That's pretty funny. <laughs> you know what I bet you though? That venomous what? fish looked a lot better than most of the aliens in this film. Oh, what makes you say that? What was more painful? Watching this film or being stung by the venomous fish? Oh. Like, I loved this film when I first saw it. I thought it was a bloody masterpiece. I thought mm-hmm. it completely solved the problems of the other two. No, I never thought that. But, um, you know, we would always act out the fight scenes, like on, on the playground, mm-hmm. you know. We'd do all the lines. I always thought Grievous was the coolest character because I was a moron. Um, yeah, me too. I still think so. Oh, man. God. Yeah, I... I um. The marketing around this movie, I think more than any other movie, was so ubiquitous in culture. Like, I remember when Batman Begins came out that year. I do not remember any of the merch. I don't remember the trailers. All I remember from that year is Star Wars. Marketing everywhere. Because Vader's in it. So Vader's face yeah. was everywhere. Vader was he was on, he was on cereal. You know, he was everywhere. Oh, I remember cereal, that um, yeah. the local newspaper, the uh, the Mercury, had this giveaway where you could go to the news agent and get these collector pins that were like little holographic pins where like you'd rotate them and it transformed. So like mm. the big one was, of course, Anakin transforms into Vader and Palpatine transforms into the Emperor. I think Obi-Wan transforms into Boga, the lizard mm. that he rides. I, th- I think in, uh, in Spain we had like in the Happy Meals. Yeah. There were like this small lightsabers that were like three inches or something nice. and like they had like in of them they had a, like a ball game but like m- m- I remember all the kids in the pre- pre- playground like playing with them with miniature lightsabers <laughs> yeah see so in, in Tasmania we just used sticks and we'd hit each other like full contact yeah we don't have sticks like that in Spain yeah well, not yeah. long strong sticks there you go bring your plastic three inch <laughs> lightsaber against my but tree. mine look real Mine yeah, like Al a sounded real. <laughs> Al sounded as real as any other lightsaber in Star Wars. Um, yeah, I, I um, this was a very important year for me in retrospect because Star Wars was, of course, the big thing that I wanted to see, and then later in the year because I think Star Wars came out in May. Came out no in in. in I'm pretty sure Revenge of the Sith came the out in summer. May. I'm pretty sure it was June or July. Would have been around then, actually, because it um, would have been around my birthday. Because the movies used to come... Like, Star Wars movies used to come out in in summer. King Kong come out. Because King Kong... Yeah, King Kong comes out December. King Kong was, like, one of those movies that... Seeing, for the first time for me, what was possible with computer-generated technology and really mm. getting it. Because you get that sense of Star Wars, but because it's alien worlds, 
and because they're very highly stylized and designed, mm. you don't really see the real world application of this technology. And, you know, I only recently watched Lord of the Rings on like a little VCR TV, so I didn't have the full appreciation for the scope of, of um, realistic graphics going on there. But seeing a monkey that is huge, that's being motion controlled by another human, suddenly made me think, oh, wow, that's what this technology can be used for. And mm. that's what a realistic kind of CG approach can look like. Like, I loved King... I, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about Peter Jackson's King Kong, but I adore it. Really? We talked about it Do you like it? I like it. I, I like it a I lot. It, I think a lot of people, like, groan when they hear about yeah. it. Yeah. And it's like, Ugh. And it's like, well, it's, it's not that bad. It's really not bad. Like, it's... It's not that bad. It's very saccharine. Like, it's a very... It's very earnest. Long. Yeah, it's long. It's, it's very long. And it's incredibly sincere. Like, it's about... It's one of the most sincere movies ever made. Hmm. Like, it's a movie about the movies of the 40s and... The 30s and the 40s in America. And the movies in the 30s and 40s in America were not that nice with the way they depicted, you know, everyday life and people. Like, for a movie that's paying homage to so much classic Hollywood cinema, it lacks any of the depth or the stakes or the drama of classic Hollywood cinema. Have you seen the classic? Which one? The original King Kong? Yeah. Yeah. Ages ago. Yeah. I th- I think the original King Kong's because... kind of... Like, everyone's kind of scummy in that. Like, even Anne Darrow, I remember being kind of like... She's sort of like a, a, a mischief maker. I, I thought Jack Black was a bit of an asshole in, in, in the, the movie. Remake. Yeah. No, he is and an asshole. The, and then there is the, the, the main, but, but the, he... the lead guy that is also an asshole that abandons them and comes back later. Yeah, but... he, he's probably my favourite part of the movie, Kyle Shambler. Yeah. He's actually really good in it. You know who I think sucks in it? The girl? What's her no. name? Oh, who? Naomi Watts? She's awesome in it. Is she? No, I was going to say... Um... No, the guy, yeah, um, pianist. Yep, Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody. I just watched today. It's an I, awful, I didn't know he did this. He's an awful action lead. What are the other? Oh, the Predator, Predators, which he's fine in. Yes, it, it's weird that he's the. He lead looks of really that. small. Who is a worse lead of a Predator movie, Boyd Holbrook or Adrian Brody? Wait, who's the first one? Um, Boyd from uh, the Predator. Oh, Brody. Adrian Brody is so much worse. No. I think Boyd Holbrook's a great actor. I think Boyd Holbrook. He's terrible I think he's a good role. actor, but I think it's terminate. It's a, they're, te- they're Predator. It's one of the. It's so bad. I can't. I we're can't, doing Predator at some point on this podcast. I, I All guess five movies. Six if we're counting AVP. Oh fuck yeah! Both AVPs. Oh, I don't want to talk about Requiem. I want to see it. I haven't seen it since the theaters. Yeah, I watched so it. So I kind of want to watch it I again. I can't believe you saw it in theaters. I always assumed that was a straight to DVD. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Do you remember the marketing around AVP one? Like that was an event. That was like a serious, huge film. You know who directed that film? Yeah, I know. Paul W S Anderson. Paul W S Thomas Wes Anderson. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) big one of those. But like, it's weird that he directs that because all he's done before then is Resident Evil. So it's kind of nuts that he gets handed that. Hmm. Like that that's two of the biggest franchises Fox has. Yeah. And they're like the previous guy Didn't Resident who, Evil make a lot of money. I I don't know if it made it must have, but I think it it was pretty cheap, so Yeah, it was a really cheap film. Anyway, uh yeah. Um Batman Begins, did you see it two thousand five? Uh funny thing, I saw the Dark Knight. Yeah. Not knowing that the Dark Knight was a Batman film. What the fuck are you talking about? I had a friend who I I always went to the cinema cinema with. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. we always went to the cinema like almost every weekend or something. Yeah, we always went to the cinema together, like to watch something. And he told me, "Oh, let's watch this movie called The Dark Knight." You are right. The Resident Evil films made an obscene amount of money. Uh, Resident Evil one, one made a hundred million. No, they all have made like yeah, they all pretty decent money. money. The first one made a hundred and two million against thirty three million. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. Anyways, The Dark Knight. I went to see The Dark Knight and then I go to the theaters and then I saw all the posters and all that. And it's like the Joker with the yeah with all that. And I'm like, wait a second. Is this a Batman film? My friend was like, yeah, it's a Batman film. And I saw it and I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I believe did, for I a did, second that you didn't see, know that. Because I didn't see Batman Begins. I was alive in 2008. There was not a single place you could go where I there was wasn't a, marketing of that movie. I was in a different country. I know, but that's nuts. I was in a different country. Imagine if you hadn't known until the movie started, and then you hope it on the Joker scene, you're like, this crime drama is wicked. 
and then Batman shows up like 15 minutes in. it was something like that because I was I wasn't expecting it to be that dramatic or anything yeah it's great I hadn't seen Batman Begins so I'm like hey we talked about well we talked about in the last podcast we'll probably do Nolan when uh, Tenet is coming Mm -hmm. is coming so let's uh, let's not give the dark let's not give the most talked about movie outside of Star Wars any more talk time you tell about how Star Wars begins and why it sucks and I'm grabbing my charger I'll bear it back you wanna read the crawl I don't wanna read the crawl oh yeah funny thing about the crawl hurry up yes Funny thing about the crawl in this film, I think it's the only crawl that does have like politics in it. It starts the first, the very first word is war, in exclamation, and then it's something about you know the uh, the Lord, the Sith Lord Count Dooku is taking over or something. But there's no politics in the crawl. Baron, can you believe it? You're here now. Politics in the crawl. There's no politics in the crawl at all. All the other Star Wars films have politics on the crawl. Yeah, and weirdly, this film probably is the most political. And this is the most political one. This one actually deals with how governments fall. And by deals with it, I mean it barely deals with it at all, except for a couple of scenes. (laughs) By deals with it, you mean uh, it just happens. (laughs) They say, oh, let's make the Empire. No, no, you're forgetting the most important line, which is he declares that he has power, unlimited power. Unlimited. Ah, I thought that was literal. Like, he had like so much power in his fingers and the light. Uh, no, lighting. it's both, Gabe. See, George Lucas is a very sophisticated writer, and by showing that Palpatine is able to generate power, it's also reflecting the fact that he has metaphorical power in government. You see, it's much more clever than you're giving it credit for. So you're telling me that Kanduk also had political power? Well, he's a count. Of course, he did. See, this just means he has money. Now, you like this opening scene, this opening battle scene. I think the visual effects look pretty cool. I think they look good compared to clones. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But you know what? Uh, you, you know, this is the thing about something like um, Peter Jackson's King Kong. That's a terrible example. This is the thing about movies that use CG in effective ways. The problem with the way that CG work goes in movies these days and this is what people like Ang Lee don't seem to understand is that you essentially have several houses at usually one or more in the case of Star Wars I believe it's just ILM doing all the principal effects because it's George Lucas's company and of that facility there's you know around 1500 artists at capacity less usually because there's multiple offices around the world and the thing that makes films like Take Shelter which is a very cheap film that has like two or three very sophisticated visual effects shots, looks so good, or Blade Runner 2049 looks so good, is that they are able to, using special effects supervisors and VFX supervisors, look at the movie and decide which way they're going to approach the effects for each of the different shots. And often, when they need to save money and costs, because I'll remind you, this film has 2,200 visual effects shots which I think was the most of any movie up until this point. The original Star Wars, Episode 4, how many do you think it had? Visual effects shots. Oh, we can't do background? Yeah, everything. Backdrops? Guess. Guess how many shots of the whole film. This Revenge can't of the... Can't backdrops? Revenge Probably of the... 100 or something. 350. 350? Yeah. So it's more than... It's a lot think. more. Yeah, it's a lot. It seems like a lot. It's really not, though, in this day and age. Like, by this point, we're at the point, because O Brother Where Art Thou comes out in 98, and that is the first film that has every single shot as a visual effect. Because of the the way they um, colour graded the entire film. And now every film has every single shot as a visual effect, because we do the same thing. Like, I work on corporate videos now, where every single shot is digitally retouched and digitally graded. Of course. Yeah, everything is digitally touched up now. The problem is, when every single time you're seeing a guy in a suit, like a clone trooper, and that guy is CG, you then have to have 15 to 20 artists working on that scene just to make sure all the guys look right. And the thing that's so clever about guys like... I hate to harp on about him, but Nolan, is that he's like, I'm going to spend a huge amount of money up front to build some of this stuff practically, so then when it comes time for In Inception us to build all these collapsing buildings that's all that the vfx team needs to worry about is these five minutes of buildings collapsing rather than two and a half hours of cg battles i'm pretty sure they blew up the building in inception 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that. I just wanted to say, you know, when the VFX team were told to do it, he was like, yeah, no, we're not. We're doing it for real. Do you remember how crazy it was that for Interstellar, he like flew a spaceship into a black hole and just filmed the whole yes, thing? Yes, I know, right? That was nuts. How weird was it that Matthew McConaughey found that bookshelf and Nolan just filmed him? Yeah, it. it's weird. I submitted that fact to um, to True Movie Facts about how one day um, Matthew McConaughey got so high with Woody Harrelson on the set of Interstellar that he actually couldn't work. And so Christopher Nolan used his dream technology that he developed for Inception to go inside Matthew McConaughey's head where he found the bookshelf set and filmed all of that. You like that theory? It's true, man. It's real. I, I know a key grip who worked on that yeah, film. He was like, yeah, that's right. it was crazy. Nolan just whipped out his dream machine and we were all, <laughs> we were all on Matthew McConaughey's <laughs> wild ride. He almost has it on him, right? Murph! Murph! Um, you know what this film could have used more of? Special effects? <laughs> Matthew McConaughey emoting. Yeah, my big thing with this opening battle scene is that they're in the middle of like an aerial dogfight, right? Mm-hmm. The first line that they deliver is something like, Oh, master, the ship's right ahead. And he's... They're so subdued. Like, I, I've complained on every single one of these episodes about how wooden the acting is. Yeah. This movie truly is inexcusable with how subdued these performances are. Because at least you can argue in Phantom Menace with the scenes that I've nah. pointed out. No, you can. Nah. Because it's people sitting on a ship in a peaceful situation, talking to each other. It's people on Coruscant discussing politics. Maybe they're bored. Who cares? Attack of the Clones. You know, they're just chilling out on our planet. In this film, they're in the middle of the most extravagant battle you've ever seen. And they're like, Master, the ship's right ahead. We should turn left this way. And it's like, no, you're in a... Like, he should be screaming out. Oh my God, look at this. We're going to fucking die. Remember when uh, Mace Windu lands in Genosis and he just walks up, like he kind of like faces the He towards... strolls up to the soldier and says, Sir, the battle's going good. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's all the same. It's always it's the same in all three films. Yeah, it's really wooden in all three. My, my funny thing, my complaint about this opening scene, like yeah. this opening, it's way too long. Battle, right? The, the battle, not the whole scene. Is that General Rivers' ship it takes them seven minutes to get on the ship. General Rivers' ship. Yep. It's just the ship. What do you want it to be? It's not different than the others. There isn't like. A whole fleet around it trying to protect it or anything. It's just a ship in the middle of space. Yeah. Around other ships. That looks the same as the other ships. Like, there's not like... Like the Super Star Destroyer in... Oh, I'm sure it's not called that, but that's what everyone calls it. Yeah. It looks different. And you know, it's important no, just it is, by it looking at it. It is a Super it. Star Destroyer in Return of the Jedi. Yeah, yeah it's called yeah. the Super Star Destroyer. You look at it. It's bigger. You know that that's the bad guy's We're ship. We're going to talk about this later on when we get into the podcast, but this movie does a terrible job with cinematically emphasising things that are significant. Yeah. And Grievous' ship is the first great example. I mean... Yeah. The introduction of Grievous is a, another good example. Like, the first time he's introduced is when they board the ship and he just comes in and he's wearing... Oh, you like Grievous. I think he is almost... I like Grievous I think because... he's almost more worse than Jar Jar. You say that. I think I like Grievous because of Clone Wars. Yeah, well, that's not fair. You gotta... That's not fair. In this film, he's. But I, I, I think I think Jar Jar is a lot. Like you say, Jar Jar is like Grievous is worse than Jar Jar. I don't think so. Grievous. I, I think sucks. Jar Jar is a lot worse. You know who did the voice of Grievous? Yeah, you told me. I forgot. Yeah, the sound engineer Matthew Wood. Do you mm -hmm. know who was going to do the voice of Grievous? Oh, uh, who? Gary Oldman. Oh, I wonder because, why he turned it down. Uh, well, allegedly because of a union dispute with the Actors Guild over here. He couldn't do it. Oh my God, so... Gary now, Matthew, my... Matthew Wood is also not Australian. Matthew Wood is... So I don't know why he was able to. So I feel like part of that is... Um, well, I told you how Liam Neeson was meant to have a role in this as a voice performance. And then he yeah. uh, kind of walked away. Yeah, I wonder why. He visited the set, though. Well, yeah, so did, but you can do yeah, that. Yeah, so did Spielberg. Just look visited the set of... One of the new Star Wars films, I'm sure. Ooh, do you think? He, he he just look as we said at the set of... He must have visited Force Awakens. Yeah, of course. He yeah. must have. But, um... How great is that clip of George Lucas directing Game of Thrones? I haven't seen the clip. You haven't watched it? No. It's really funny. Okay. George Lucas is, like, really funny. He looks, like, relaxed. Did, it's nice. Does he direct the best scene? Yeah, yeah! No, he's directing it? a scene between um, Daenerys and Jon... 
And then he's like giving Daenerys a whole bunch of notes and he's like shouldering Jon off and he's like, yeah, so I just want you to do this and this. And then he looks at Jon and he's like, I don't really care what you do. You just do whatever you want. And he's just like totally focused on her and it's really funny and everyone like gets it. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, man, he's good. He's good. I would love... I don't know, we just saw a film of his. I don't think he's that good. I would love to see what would have happened if George Lucas... If Star Wars had only made $500 million instead of a billion dollars. <laughs> because look at Spielberg. Like, Spielberg has had many more successes than Lucas. Mm-hmm. And he's still hungry. Like, in every film he makes, even the films that don't quite work, like Ready Player One, don't you feel like he's still trying to do stuff that's creative and innovative? Yeah, but I I honestly don't think George Lucas is as good as Spielberg. I haven't seen his early films, to be honest. Mm. But I don't think George Lucas... like. I think he excels in uh, several specific areas. Yeah, he excels in some areas, but he... I don't know, look at the prequels. They are really, really bad. I would... Like, say, in many, yeah. many ways. It's not yeah, just yeah, yeah. one specific thing. It's not just the acting. It's not just this or that. It's a lot of bad things on them. Mm. And, like... I would say George Lucas is amazing at two specific things. Which, watching these prequels and watching his early films, I think is true. Which are... He is unquestionably one of the masters, if not, like, the master at visual shorthand for um, establishing characters and action. I think he is Whoa, so clever what, at it. Where do you yeah. get that from? From the original Star Wars. From anywhere Ed, in the yeah. prequels. Where does that... that does... Well, does he that do that in anywhere near the prequels? Oh, with the way the Jedi are introduced in Phantom, with the robes, with the the kind of reveal of them. What oh. they just move their hood o- hoods over? Yeah, with the way that he uses holograms, I don't know. He no, just, I think he's You're wrong. With the way that Maul is introduced, I think he's what he's just there. Yeah. <laughs> he just appears and moves, crosses his arms. Man, you got to... You try. You try. The other thing that he's amazing at, which no one can argue, is he's an incredible. Um, He's an incredible pioneer of world building. He is yes. without question. I thought that was going to be your main point. That is my main point, really. Okay. The, and in this movie, you see it more than any of the prequels. Like, every five minutes, there's a different world that you're going to. Mm. And they're all yeah. pretty interesting, like, visually. Yeah. The yeah. problem is that there's no depth to them The whatsoever. problem is that you didn't spend any time on them. But that's what I mean. He's good at iconography. I think the one thing he's really good at, often, is iconography. I think and playing on classical icon- iconography. I, th- I say he's really good at taking Kurosawa's... Some of Kurosawa's... No idea. No, you've like, lost me. Yeah. Some of Kurosawa's things, I'm like... Take them, like... Mm. Some of Kurosawa's uh, stories or ideas... And adapt them on his own way. Because when people you say... Hidden Fortress, When people right? say... Hidden Fortress. Which isn't Star Wars. They, they say, oh, Star Wars. And like, I, I once said, yeah. I want to see a Star Wars-like film, but in, like, uh, Japan. Like, yeah, in and people Japan, immediately right? say... And people say, well, that's Hidden Fortress. We saw Hidden Fortress, and they have nothing in common. It has nothing Some in common with Star Wars. Some characters, I guess. Well, that's what Lucas has but acknowledged. He's like, the that thing much. that I took from Hidden Fortress wasn't the plot. It was the fact that it's told from two low-level status characters. Yeah, so I think... Three PO. I think he was good on, on doing that. I'm taking... Uh, uh, like ideas, like yeah, but so is, images. So is every director. So is fucking Spielberg. No, and but the, the, nowadays you see all these films that, like, even Joker takes a shot from King of Comedy. Which shot did you mean? I want, to, I want to talk about which shot. The you final shot of the Joker in the asylum. Oh, because in the he asylum, chasing the security goes guards. In the, That's right. in the right, and then the guy chases and, and, him, and, and then he goes the other way. The yeah. other way. I forgot and they do that yeah. in King of Comedy. It's the exact same shot, but in same King of Comedy, timing. it's way better. I think they're both alright, but like when I, when I saw it in King of Comedy, it's like so Joker I'm just so glad ripped watched, this off. I'm so glad you watched King of Comedy. It just ripped it off. It should have ripped more stuff off, honestly. We're not talking about Joker though. We're talking oh, about Star Wars. Oh man. Nope. We're talking about Star you Wars. You really like Joker, right? We're talking about Star do you still Wars. Really I'm not like gonna it, talk like about in re- it. In retrospect, yes. I'm gonna talk about Star okay. Wars now. All right. Okay. All right. You you brought it up. I didn't. I didn't bring it up. It's all I, you. I just said they land uh, on Grievous's ship after a very uneventful encounter with some droids, and we have the. It's like a roller coaster of like scenes. 
There's so many small so many si- beats. How long does it take for them to get to Coruscant? Because all it's like, it's like almost really... twenty minutes. It's more than twenty. I think it's. I think it's. Oh yeah, no, you're right. It is twenty-four minutes. Like twenty-three minutes into the movie. Yeah, yeah. When they land. Yeah. Yeah. And like every nothing every... matters except that Go- Dooku dies and Palpatine persuades Anakin to kill him. It's just random. I mean, nothing happens. That's pretty important. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's pretty not, massive. It's, uh, yeah, he, it's the main villain of the last film, and he just now dies in a the lot of people minutes. claim that the thing that is good about these prequels is that they depict Palpatine's rise to power, which you and I have refuted on these last two podcasts. Mm-hmm. I think this mm-hmm. film makes a stronger case than any of the other films because this film has to play so much catch up with Anakin and Palpatine's relationship. Yeah, like all through this film, they talk about oh your relationship with Palpatine, your friendship with Palpatine. You and Palpatine are much too close. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. haven't seen them interact at all outside of that all, one no. scene in Clones. Yeah, it's nonsense. It's pretty Absolute nonsense. nonsensical. It's kind of like the Obi Wan and Anakin relationship. Yes, it's they're very. Like, much. Oh, they're best friends, and um, they talk about it. You don't see it. No, nope, you they, don't see they it. They talk at all. about it. One thing I want to briefly mention: so the battle's happening over Coruscant, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, this is a, a huge battle. Uh-huh. Business is fine on Coruscant. Like, yeah. no one's freaked out. It's, it's, no it's... one's no one's panicking. No one's evacuating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can you imagine how interesting the opening of this film would have been if we saw Palpatine get kidnapped? And, like, we saw Separatist ships firing on Coruscant? I, yeah. And we had, like, buildings collapsing, and it was, like, scary? I, I don't know when it came out, but there was the animated series. It's 2D animated, not the 3D animated Clone Wars. Yeah. But there was a Clone Wars series, which is kind of like a bridge from Attack of the Clones to Revenge. Right. And the final couple I've of episodes... I've seen the movie, not the... No, the movie's awful. I've heard the movie. So no. Well, uh, it's, it's the 2D movie. animated series, yeah. which is not the same as the 3D one. They're different. It's also directed it's... by Jendi Tar- Tarkovsky, right? I don't know. Uh, he's, the, uh, he's the guy behind Samurai Jack. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah. that guy's yeah. great. Yeah, Jendi Tar- um, Tarkovsky. The funny thing about that, uh, the Clone Wars thing, is yeah. that they, they kind of like do the canon between... It's meant to be canon, what yeah. actually happens in between the two films. Yeah. You see where, how c gets the cloak of gold. You see Anakin get knighted. You see yeah. the interaction of Grievous. And you see how um, uh, the Chancellor is kidnapped. And, right. and it ends on the start of this film. Cool. There's a huge battle on the city. Great. Not, Where nothing, is it? There's, there's, there's nothing. In this. Nothing in this. I don't know if they made it before the film or yeah. after this. Film. Okay, now we. So I don't know. Maybe they just made it up. We come to my my biggest problem with this film, and I think you're going to disagree with me about this. I actually think that what they do to Padme's character in this film is one of the worst character assassinations in <sighs> certainly in any franchise I can think of. Really? Yeah. In any like any franchise? Any t- I. I there's a worse one in this franchise. No, I don't yes. think it's worse. I think this is much worse. How is this? Okay, to Padme in film one, she is an assertive um, young print, young queen who is trying to preserve her people's way of life and preserve their safety, and she is willing to like travel across the galaxy to try and get help to fight back against the army that is um, dominating yeah. her society. Film two, she is hunted. She is um, under threat, yet she still is able to, you know, have fun and be be jovial. And at the end of the film, as you pointed out quite quite rightly, she is the one who says, "Anakin, we've got to go save Obi Wan. I'm going. You've got to come with me." She takes charge. She becomes yeah, the, the clone, she becomes the, the leader. Clones, yeah. And in the bloody clone battle, she's there. She's fighting. She's the one who like tries to shoot down Dooku at the end. She's like a fierce warrior senator. She's like a cool character in the first two films. Mm-hmm. They don't do much with her, but she's pretty cool. In this film, she is transformed into Anakin. I love you. I'm gonna have your baby. I'm just gonna wait around until you come home for me, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so I can have your baby. You're you're right about this. You're completely right. Padme, uh, Luke Skywalker oh. goes from trying to save his father, and the only thing he wants to do is save his father. Yeah, to wanting to kill his nephew because he saw a vision the one thing that's, I'll that's say, an assassination that is worse than this the one thing i'll say to defend that is that there's 30 years of character development <laughs> off screen between that this is like this is, this is like fucking two years, 10 years. Two come years. on two years two years it's like two years it's how long do the clone wars go for a long time it's really? not two years the clone Anakin wars, hasn't aged at all clone wars is meant to be the biggest event be, uh before you know anakin hasn't aged it would have been but, cool but if he, he was old but he aged 
10 years in five years so maybe i think we can both agree <laughs> years I, I think we can both agree that the impact of clone war of the war in this film is not felt nope at all no nope. and they're going to see a show yeah. later in the film oh yeah and they go they go to the and opera. everyone's is like yeah. really rich and and like nice now general grievous um hate his voice hate his cough it's george lucas's cough did you know that yeah, you told me. Yeah, they recorded like his cough. He he liked the he one day they were, he was like what, the, sn- about- the sneak behind him one day he, when he was sick he was like <coughs> when he was eating his and, salad. And they, they just recorded him from the behind. Why why is that photo of him eating the salad so funny? Because it's David Lynch. Oh, he loved salad. Can you tell this story? I don't think you've told it on the podcast. No, I haven't told it in the podcast. Do you so- want to save it for Return of the Jedi though? Well, we're gonna forget about it. Nah, you'll remember. Okay, I remember. You'll remember. Okay, let's, ju- let's just keep bringing it up in every episode, but yeah. not telling it. Yeah. All right, you got to tell it now. We've brought it up. People okay. So, David Lynch. Yeah. He great director. is a great director. A great director that I don't love as much as everyone else. What's your, what's your you favorite? You don't love him that much? I don't, really? lo- I don't love him. I, l- I love... Um, You're an Ele- idiot. We're not friends anymore. I love yeah. Elephant Man, and I really like Mahalo Drive. I haven't seen that much of him. He's I really honest. like Twin Peaks. But like, anything Twin that Peaks I- is awesome. Anything that I've seen of him, it's... Pretty. A razor head's great. Pretty great. I, I've I, seen a razor head more than five. Lost it. Highway and Blue Velvet just don't do it for me. I have only seen a razor, a razor head on Mulholland. Mulholland Drive. Do you love uh, which which one do you like more? Would you say? I think Mulholland Drive probably. I thought like you'd more. be so big on a razor head. I really like a razor head, but That's like so you. I, I think about it and I'm like I can only remember like a couple of scenes from it. Yeah. Which is the baby at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yeah. Hard to forget. <laughs> and, and like when when he goes to, when he first goes to see um uh, the family. Yeah. Of her family, right? Yeah. And then there's that old lady that she gets like her uh, cigarette on oh, her mouth. She's so good. And it's like, ugh. Yeah. But then I think of Mulholland Drive and it's like, man, there's so many Mason bits. That's in it. true. There's the singing. There's, there's the there's funniest the, the comedy. The funniest comedy scene of all time, where people keep coming in into a murder scene, so he has to keep killing them. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. He has to keep killing people because they keep coming in. I love the um the guy played by uh, just, oh, Justin Thoreau, who like comes home. The like director who comes home to find his wife with the other guy, and then like he gets pink paint like all over him because they're painting. Yeah. And then the cowboy, how he goes out and meets the cowboy with no eyebrows. It's so good. Yeah, it's great. And then there's... Alright, the, I love David Lynch. And then there's the, 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 the driver... The, the what? The diner scene, which is the most amazing oh, scene incredible. of all time. Incredible. Might like, be the best scene of all time. I'm not even this, joking. This is saying I love about how great movie scenes sort of act as small short films in a larger story. And that scene is 100% typifies that. Well, that scene is just a short film. It literally is just a <laughs> it's short just film. It's just a short film in, in, in the film. It's so good though. Um, anyway, David Lynch, he got contacted by George Lucas. Yes. Uh, to see if he was interested in, in filming, or uh, directing, uh, the third of his great franchise, Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, right? Yeah. David Lynch, which is, he did Dune, which he I think... He just it, done Dune? He just done Dune, I think. I think and it's it was pre-Dune. a flop, right? It was a flop. Dune? Yeah, yeah, huge flop. It was a huge flop. So he gets contacted. You know why it was a huge flop? Why? Because it starred bloody Sting and um, his guy. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a kind weird... of Kyle. Kyle. It's also a really weird film, like really, really weird. And are you, are you keen? Bad. Are you keen for Vil- Villeneuve's Dune? Yeah, because he's a good director. Like Dune. No, it's before Dune. Eighty three is Jedi. Okay, so yeah. he gets asked before Dune. He's uh, just done Elephant Man and a Razorhead, so it's really early in his career. Okay, that's really early in his career. Right. Yeah. For some reason, George Lucas liked him, and he wanted him to make uh, the last of the Star Wars films. And it's a really funny in- uh, interview with David Lynch that he describes describes his yeah. meeting with George Lucas as like extremely bus- bizarre, or bus- bus- bizarre, right? Yeah. Which is like from David Lynch, one of the uh, one of the weirdest directors in in Hollywood history. Yes, yeah, so w- tell tell me tell me like A to B what happened at this meeting that he said. Well, he uh, he pretty much goes meets with him. He tries to get into his studio, and there's like a bunch of like um, uh, secretaries that take him at Lucasfilm. Yeah, it's Lucasfilm that take him to Lu- just Lucas, and they just Lucas takes him out on a drive, and I think it was in. A, Mustang or something like that. It's yeah, really right. Nice some, car. some nice car. Yeah. And he takes he takes Lynch uh, to a salad bar, 
Yeah. And he, David Lynch says it in the funniest way. He says, "This a, it's a restaurant that only serves salads. And he said it was so weird. And I don't know, it's really funny to think that jo- uh, David Lynch thinks that George Lucas is it's weird. It's pretty funny. It's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, I was reading these amazing uh, collection of um, filmmakers shitting on other filmmakers. And there was like one hilarious one where I think it was, um, I really don't want to get the names wrong, but I think it was Ingmar Bergman just like crapping on Spielberg. And it was so funny. It was like so bit. It was so bitter. I just couldn't get over how how bitter and hilarious it was. Um, speaking of uh, filmmakers shitting on other filmmakers, um, this week we have it has been decreed by the film gods that uh, Marvel films are now no longer cinema and are in fact despicable works of art. I don't think Martin Scorsese is a film. He's a god of filmmaking. He's, uh, if he's not, then who is? If if Kubrick said it, I'd be like, okay. Kubrick would have shat on Marvel films. He yeah, would have no. hated them. Did you see that photo I seen of Kubrick holding the M60 yeah, from Full Metal? That's so good. He's, like, ah. He's having so much fun. <laughs> That's the thing I love about Kubrick is that everyone's like, oh, he was so serious and he was so like have you seen, intense. Hell, have you seen Doctor Strange Love? He's not that serious. I love... I, I told you it's I listened really to like this, th- this three-hour interview with him the other day. Like, yeah, I know. He's one of the most elusive directors who ever lived. And for some reason, there's this three-hour interview with him where he just talks about like his favourite football team for 20 minutes. Yeah, you know, um, you know I know the three-hour thing? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, All right, it's the love story. It's podcast because we're taking too long. The love story in this... I thought we were going for three for three. Yeah. On this one. We did one for one, two for two, now we're doing three for three. Yeah. Francis Skywalker is going to be... Mate, we're 29 minutes in. We're doing well. Yeah, we're doing well, right? <laughs> hey, that's almost half the ratio. We're doing good. Yes. Um, And then we have the greatest scene of Star Wars, which is, I love you. It's because I'm so in love with you. So love have, has blinded you? I think that's the worst one. No, no, that's not what I mean. That's the worst one. So love have blinded you. That's That's... Well, that's the awful. one scene where she pushes back a bit, and it's like it could be. Good. What? And no. Then immediately after that, they're I just want to point out. Other. I just want to point out to everybody who hasn't rewatched this film and is going to rewatch it. The scene when Natalie Portman is on the balcony telling Anakin how she wants to, you know, have their baby back on Naboo and all of this stuff. Did we skip over the fact that she's pregnant? Yeah. Yeah. So Padme's she's pregnant. Padme's pregnant, and we think Christensen. That's the best bit of acting he's done in the whole prequels, which is like. He's shocked. He's shocked, and he kind of like... And he doesn't know how he feels. He's a bit scared yeah. about it. And he says, oh, it's, um, it's great, great. You know it's why like, he's scared great. about it? Because they're standing in the middle of a public street where all of their friends are, and she's very loudly announcing, I'm pregnant, and they've just been kissing, and they're meant to have a secret marriage. <laughs> like, they live in the middle of the city on a high-rise... She's like an incredibly famous they person. They live together. They That's live, so weird they to They should me. live in like an apartment... Like they should have like a little secret getaway. Yeah, in you that, know, in like that random planet. Yeah, like um, Ken Watanabe has an in Inception. So Anakin's motivation for the film is to discover the secret to prevent death. And what does he do when he's feeling conflicted and he's got all these negative emotions? He goes to the smartest Jedi of them all. So we're told, Master Yoda. Yeah. Who immediately says to him, "Yeah, don't uh, love anyone. Fun. Don't trust your feelings." Yeah. Mm. Mm. Maybe you should like just keep doing your own thing and like ignore about it. Ignore everyone I'll else. And never come back. Just, attachment. Just attachment leads to depression. Depression leads to anger. Anger, anger leads, leads to, to murdering to children. children. <laughs> younglings. You should murdering younglings. younglings. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yoda sucks in these. <laughs> fucking asshole. He's so rude. He's like th- this guy that is mean. It's like. They didn't want him to take him in. No. In Italy. They were like, he's too he old. He comes, like, he's too old, he's dangerous. He's dangerous. They, they, say, they even say that, he's dangerous. Obi-Wan yeah. says that. Uh, he comes to you saying, I'm feeling like trouble right now. You're like, yeah. oh, whatever. Yeah, and <laughs> just, just, I know that apparently Palpatine is blocking their force, but just look at Anakin. He looks like he's having a hard time. Maybe, maybe Yoda should be like, maybe uh, yeah, what's is, going on with you? Maybe Yoda's blind. Well, he's not he, blind, it's stupid. He can only sense the force around him. Well, he sees that laser bolt coming at him later. No, he doesn't. He, the laser bolt misses. It's, he's not blind. Stop being silly. Stop being silly on this. This is a serious podcast, Gabe. Yeah, please. Tell me more about Inception. Are you ready for my favourite line delivery of all time? In the next scene when Anakin is talking with Palpatine, Palpatine says, You will be placed on the... Uh, sorry. 
you will be placed on the council, Anakin. And he says, Master, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Master. I'm overwhelmed. This is everything he's ever wanted. If there's ever a time to see Anakin happy and overwhelmed and in joy and gratitude, it's this moment. I don't, I don't think George Lucas knows any of those emotions. He obviously does. He obviously does. I well, don't he's know. He's in his salad, I guess. Uh, yeah. Anakin, <laughs> just pretend that you're, you've got the chance to eat, <laughs> to eat a salad. Just pretend you have a salad. You've right been so too. hungry all day, and now you have a chance to eat a salad. Oh, thank you, Master. I'm overwhelmed. I'm so joyful. Yeah. Thank you, Master. I'm overwhelmed, I guess. Yeah, Palpatine and Anakin's relationship is very half-baked in this movie. And it sucks, because that is the whole point of the movie, is to see I them end up together. I, I point these out at the end. I have some you know the whole thing about heat, right? Where the way that heat works as a movie, people argue... Wait, is... heat is a movie? I thought you were talking about the temperature. The door's right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the whole argument that like screenwriters at our, at our school and people I've talked to have made about that movie is that it's structured very much in the same way as like a meet cute love story, just with criminals. Not intent- not intentionally, but like they hit the same beats that a love story needs to hit with the way these two criminals come together. But you can do that a lot with other films. Heat has a special kind of um, structure to it where that's one of the things that it's most similar to and I think this film sort of is that way with Anakin and Palpatine no no yeah think about it think about it they they have a few casual conversations at work so they can't be too flirtatious then Palpatine's like oh Anakin I'm going to the opera if you want to come along you know you're welcome I've got a plus one I'll get all these people out I'll tell you some you know sexy bedtime Sith stories then, you know, later on, when um, they're alone together, Palpatine's like, I can show you things. I can show you lots of new things yes, that you when, haven't when thought about. Yes, when they agree to be together... Lots of new abilities. Then, when they agree to be together, they are not together until the very end of the film. No, no, they agree to get, be together after they've, after they've fucked. And then he's like, oh, I don't know about this. And Palpatine's like, well, you go figure out your feelings. Go kill, oh, go God, kill, a, bunch stop, of, stop, kill a bunch of children. Come back to me. Stop trying to make this metaphor. Oh, uh, yeah, like, yeah. Weird. It's, Hey, it's not as weird as Anakin and Palpatine's relationship in this movie. So the Jedi are organising the war efforts, which, considering there's a galactic senate of thousands and thousands of people, what are they doing all day? The senate? Yeah. Is George trying to make a point? Clapping. Oh, oh. Oh, you're getting political now. But, like, we are, we are protectors of the peace, not soldiers, is infamously said in the second movie. The Jedi are, like, the commanders of all of these armies. Yeah. A- every army has to have a Jedi. They, yeah. they, they are the generals. Yeah, they're so desperate for Jedi that they've got, like, bloody Kyati Mundi leading them. Now, Obi-Wan and Anakin have their first truly serious chat of the movie where Obi-Wan says, we need you to spy on the Chancellor. Mm-hmm. Anakin... Do you, think that, do you think that was all made up by Obi-Wan? What, the... Oh, that he just wanted Anakin to do that? Yeah. No, 100% Mace Windu's told him to do it. Yeah, I know, but yeah. it would have been funny if it wasn't. Now, my favourite uh, goof of the next scene, which is where Obi-Wan's talking with Mace Windu and Yoda, and they're like, we probably shouldn't put these two people together given that we're highly suspicious one of them may be evil and the other one may be easily corruptible. And Obi-Wan's like, nah, it'll be fine. Nah, it'll be fine. Yoda's like, yeah, it'll be fine. And my favourite thing is that they're flying along in one of those uh, clone trooper ships with the doors wide open, and they're speaking at like... A temperature. Uh, they're, they're speaking at a volume slightly quieter than how we're speaking. Like, yeah, they're here. speaking like, like it's very right dangerous now. putting them together. I don't trust them. Is he not to destroy the uh, Jedi? No. Is he the not prof- to destroy the Sith? Unclear. And the bring balance is. to the Force. Yeah, and the doors are wide open. They're flying through the city, and it's completely quiet. Yeah, in the last film, it was like you were meant to protect her, or something like that. It yeah, well, like, everyone like, like yeah. screaming over. Like, you will be expelled from the Jedi order. order. <laughs> yes, but uh, he was I angry. I always remember that one. But, but he was angry. I don't know so. why? It's it's something. Epic I like. can't leave her. Oh man! And then um, Anakin and pa- and Padme. Whoa! Always... So Obi Wan doesn't do anything about their Romans? No, absolutely not. He knows about it. Yeah, he completely knows about it. Oh, oh! I guess George Lucas forgot about it. George Lucas kind of forgot about. <laughs> Isn't it great that they're doing Star Wars now? No, no, it's not great. It's so good. No, it's not great. Man, Game of Thrones, you know, brilliant writing. All through. 
All through seasons one to four. Brilliant writing. <laughs> and then five was, uh, yeah. And then six was, all right. And no, no, what are you talking about? One to four. Excellent writing. And six what a great show. Right. Perfect show. You know show. six is the only season with two 9.9s episodes? What, Battle of the Bastards and Hard Home? Yeah. No, no, no. No, that's, Hard Home's five. That's, that's five. No, no, it's Battle of the Bastards and um, the Septon. Oh, the Septon yeah, which I hate. I don't like the Septon bit at all. Really? I think it's actually where Game I think of it Thrones. makes sense. I think it's where Game of Thrones fell apart. What? Because the Cersei up until that point had always done things in a rational way, even though they're evil. She always like had a very strategic plan for dealing with her enemies, and usually it didn't involve violence. Usually it involved things like um, like plan- like with Ned Stark, it involved um, staging this you know this fight between him and Jaime. And then when her brother's captured, she used it as leverage. Like, she was a smart operator. And then all of a sudden, she's like, nah, I'm just going to blow everyone up. But she was, she was really... And she becomes Osama Bin Laden But she was King's really landing. placed in a really fucking... Uh, that was her lowest point. She just had to mount and walk in and kill the high reached, sparrow. She reached mm. her lowest point I get ever. And it was a really bad point. She got humiliated in front of the whole city. Yeah, I know. Just I saw to it. Get back I saw to it. Shit. So, what's your excuse for that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking dumb. It's like, not, though. It is. It makes sense. It's... She blows up everyone? Yes. <laughs> blows up everyone that is fucking with her. Yeah. I just want to... Just wanna... That makes sense. Because Anakin and, P- and Padme, um, immediately after Obi-Wan asks um, him to spy on the Chancellor, they actually have a decent scene together for the first time where Padme's what, like... <laughs> yeah, Padme's like... Um, this war sucks. Like, this war represents a failure to listen. Like, we need the but Chancellor that, but, to give up his powers. But that and like, sense. No, we need to give the Chancellor more powers so that the war could be over sooner. That's just politics for the... Just, uh, that's just, like, weird politics. But the fact that she says this war is about... I just about, like that she has something to do all of a sudden. But she says this war is about people uh, not listening or something like that. Yeah. doesn't make any sense. The separatists were never, like... And, and that's true. A close na- uh, country next to them, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's kind the of weird. The separatists are just evil at the guys. Beginning, at the beginning of the movie, she literally says, "I wonder sometimes if we're on the wrong side." And it's like in the previous movie, they killed your bodyguard and handmaiden and several of your staff. They tried to kill you multiple times. Like they they kidnapped you and almost killed you in fighting pits. Like, maybe they're not the best guys. Like, I know that... She, but this is the whole argument of the film that George is trying to make and I don't think comes across strongly enough, which is that in times of desperation, people turn to leaders... And this isn't at all relevant for today, at all. In times of desperation, people turn to leaders that maybe aren't the most stable of geniuses or the most good-willed of players. I'm thinking about something. Yeah. So people say how the sequel trilogy has really bad politics... Like you don't what? know. Really? Yeah, people, I've heard this argument a lot. Okay. How you don't know what the Republic is. That's like, different. What the First yeah. Order yeah. comes from, and like how much, how how do they have so much power? Yeah. And yeah. all this. What the fuck is, are the separatists? Well, they're funded by um, Viceroy Gunray. Is how what does know. he have his money? Well, he probably sells the droids. Is what I guess. But like, why but are they the, fighting? No. Okay. There's a huge difference between those two things. The reason it works in Phantom is because you obviously can infer that there's been a long established reign of them developing these machines and they've become very profitable from it. The problem with going from Return of the Jedi to um, Force Awakens is that 30 years have happened and things are exactly back where they were before and you don't have any context for why. Like The First Order is a much huger force than the Separatists. No, Much no. huger. No, it's not. Pretty big. Separatists okay. and, and the Republic are pretty End big. End of Return of the film. Jedi, the Empire is destroyed. Like, their largest military base is destroyed. There is nothing left of them. Luke Skywalker is the hero of the universe. The beginning of Force Awakens, the First Order is so powerful that they have built a planet sized Death Star. And they have, you know, enough forces to deploy across the entire universe. Oh, like, yeah. As Luke, yeah, Luke Skywalker, like Ray says to Luke in Last Jedi. First Order will control all the star systems in several weeks. How does he know that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. What? It's a pretty weird line. That's a weird line. The First Order is huge. I, 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 still don't, I still don't get what Separatists are doing in this film. 
Or who, well, the separatists, or even who oh, they yeah. are. One thing that I'll say to ju- to um, support it is that at least in film two, you hear the guy from the techno union saying. Um, <laughs> but but Count Dooku says basically we're going to combine the Trade Federation's battle droids with um, we're going to combine the Trade Federation battle droids with the super battle droids from the Techno Union. So we're like combining all these different robots and all these different factions like the Geonosians to create one super army that the Republic won't be able to fight. Little do they know, except they should know that they've got the clones. Yeah. So I think they do a better job of setting up where all the forces come from than uh, Force Awakens does. Okay. Anyway, mm. moving on in the movie, we have the great opera scene. Uh, How does this uh, opera work, Gabe? Oh, God. Uh, so when a man loves a woman... So, um, there is some bubbles. Like, I just, I just wonder how someone wrote that. How did you write that? Like, we should get the script. They, they have, like, uh, they have, like, uh, like, a couple of bubbles and, like, there's some dancings inside of it, like, going around. Like... Some people clap sometimes. It's the weirdest show. It is very weird. It's the weirdest show. But you thing know, our watch. limited earth brains probably just can't comprehend the beauty of what but we're seeing. But everything else, it's very human like. Yeah, I mean, when we go into the bar in film two, they're like gambling on pod racing. Yeah, like so it's very relatable. Everything stuff. else is very relatable except that. Yeah, and it that's pretty weird. It could have just been an opera. It could have been the opera singer from um, Blue Velvet. It could have just been fucking. From, um, from Mulholland Drive. It could have just been. Like high budgeted mm. pod racing. That's yeah, exactly. Just make it like high. What in the middle of the opera house? No, like a huge stadium of pod racing, like in freaking. Oh, okay. Like Harry Potter. No Harry Potter. Quidditch. No Harry Potter. Remember Quidditch? Yeah, it was cool. Did... No, I yes, don't know. it was. I don't know. Yes, Baron doesn't like Harry Potter. I don't like Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter. Nah. I'm trying to think what from my childhood I still like. Like Terminator, that's the one thing. And even that But they ruined it even more than other franchises. Nah. Yeah. Terminator's still okay. No, it's not. Genesis tried. The pro- to the, ruin the, it, the, yes. The, no, you know what you know what's good about Terminator is that like if the movies ever get so bad that they like it's ruined, you just time travel back before them. But the thing with Terminator is that it only has two good films. Yeah. But other yeah, franchises have true. a couple more than that. I, I tried watching Salvation again recently. It's not good. It's got a great open, uh, not a great opening. It's got a great opening battle with Bale. Hey, um, I've got to show you the practical effects of that film. Yes, the, you know what else we should talk about? Hey, that helicopter crash with Christian Bale. I don't remember anything. The of this when the EMP goes off in the opening of Terminator, I don't remember anything this is something this all the audience members are going to know about. In the first like ten minutes, there's an EMP that goes off while Christian Bale's in the helicopter, and then the helicopter crashes, and you follow him in that helicopter crash, and it's all practical. And then he yells at a cameraman. It's yeah, amazing. Right. They just left it in the movie. They just left it in the film. He left you, it do I go around ripping your fucking lights down? <laughs> I'm Batman. I think sometimes he'd just be like, he'd just go up to the to Shane Herbert, who is the DOP on that film, who he yelled at, and be like, Shane, I'm Batman. You're fucking my way. How weird would it have been if Mick G did direct Superman? And then Christian Bale was in Batman, and they ended up working together. Oh and maybe there's a there's an alternate universe where Mick G ends up directing Batman versus Superman, with Nolan producing, instead of Snyder. It would have been us terrible or worse. I wonder if it would have been worse. It would have been worse. It would have. Is that Snyder? Snyder's when Snyder's interesting in that movie, he's interesting. The problem is that and he's interesting. He's copying. Is he credited? Is he a writer on it? I don't yes, believe. Yes, he, he wrote all of them. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, David S. Goyer and Chris Terrio are definitely credited. Yes, but he's also credited. Yeah, but like one of those people out of them all has written more. Told you, Chris Terrio and he, David S. Goyer. He's in the credits. I, I know this. Yeah, of course, as director and producer. And I'm like, writer. Like, five more credits in, I swear in the to God, he's, he's only credited, perhaps, for story. I don't think Yes, he's... for story. That, that's Which is not very his... important. Yeah, of course it's important. I don't think he's to blame no, for how bad the no. script is. He is to blame how dumb the story is. Oh, yeah, but... <laughs> that's, my tra- my, that's my point. He was like, oh, let's make Dark Knight. I mean, uh, Dark Knight Rises? No, The Return of the Dark Knight. But let's. Are you trying? To, are you trying to say the Dark Knight Returns? Dark Knight Returns. Yes. 
Oh wow, I didn't realize I gave it that low rating on IMDb. I can't believe you give it that high. That was from like four years ago. I can't believe you give it that high. I was high. bitter. I was Fucking really bitter. Hell. That's, That's really the... high. No, it's not. Yes, it is. A that... four is a four is not high. A four is. He doesn't have a single writing credit. You're just making shit up. He's not. No, That's he doesn't have any weird. credit. I, I swore that he didn't That's have. That's weird. He's definitely. I don't think he's credited on Man of Steel either. I think it's just Goya. That's really weird. Yeah, pretty interesting. Nolan, I think, gets a credit on Man of Steel for the story, along with him. Because they definitely worked on it together. Uh, um, anyway, back to... Four is way too uh, high, Mate, are you getting the impression I don't want to talk about this movie? But you did the same with Attack of the Clones. That's so true, I've got to get... Well, to keep, hey, keep hey, it. next what? week... Oh, Solo. Oh, no! Yeah! Oh, I solo! I forgot! I forgot! Damn it! Oh, no! You can't have your fun for another... Hey, 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 but... but, but Right after Solo. Uh, uh, Call pen- sign, come in, come in. What? Who is this? Oh, this is Rogue. Rogue One. Rogue One? I hate that. Love it. It's great. It's, what an so awful good. film. So I good. hate it. I love Rizam Man. He's, he's great. He was having like the most bomb couple of years, and I'm really sad that he's not in. He's in this new movie about a drummer who loses his hearing that looks awesome, and I really want to see it. He's such a good actor. <laughs> Did you watch The Night Off? The HBO series that Steve... I started it. I didn't finish it. So good! Oh, man, you got to no, finish, finish it. it. It's, it's so... It's the... um, That's um Serial, the podcast. He's... It's yeah. roughly adapted from that guy's story. Yeah. Um, Check this out. Um, oh, yeah. You, you... <laughs> so we have the Battle of Kashyyyk, which... Nope. We have an establishing shot of Kashyyyk. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Then we're back to the Jedi Council. Anakin's like, Oh, I should be a Jedi Master. Blah, blah, blah. So, Obi-Wan goes to Utapar to hunt down General Grievous. Yes. And uh, the droids see him. Clearly see him. E- excuse see me. That excuse me. A... He rides a lizard called Boga. Go on. Well, oh. What? Yeah, the droids see him. But no, no, no. He arrives to the planet. Oh, sorry. I jumped ahead. the droids yeah. see him. Yeah. Obviously, they <laughs> see an, a Jedi master, a Jedi at least, come in. And then there's this guy. This that guy, is like really tall. The and he, He's like Senator. saying, "Oh, it's it's all oh, it's all it's just nothing." There's Excuse no me. One here. This guy, played by Bruce Spence, Australian legend, actor if, who played yeah, the gyro I'm captain, sure who played the him. voice of Sauron, everyone played one of the sharks him, yeah. in Finding Nemo. Bruce Spence is a living legend. Um, everyone knows and him. Yeah, as definitely. I pointed out to you, not only do the droids see him, but he's saying, "Oh yes, everything's fine here. Nothing is wrong. Everything's happy. There's no war unless you brought it with you." Yeah. And then. He's like, oh, okay, we'll give you something here. And then he just steps in like an inch. And he's like, <laughs> we're being held hostage. They're right here. They're on level 10. Go kill them all. Did you bring extra backup? We really need it. Yeah, there's something I never got as a kid. Yeah. There's droids looking at at everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. Magna and then, and then uh, he, he kind of like orders his, his droid to make the ship go away. Yes. Right? But the droids can the see. The droids can see that he can't get, get into it. the ship. Like, how dumb are they? Yeah, but Obi-Wan's a master of the Jedi mind trick, so clearly he just, like, was mind tricking everyone. No! <laughs> no! Yeah, yeah, that's that's what happened. But it's a droid! They mate, can't mind yeah, trick a droid. It, it's Star Wars. Whenever you can't get out of a situation, it's you use the magic. Force. Yeah. That's not how the Force works. Yeah, that's right. That's not how the Force it's works. It's the best, the best line. And then the he gets into the lizard. Do you know the name Excuse of? me, Boga. 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 It's a female. Yeah, it's a female. Everyone, and why did you what? assume it was a male lizard, Gabe? I think you need to check your... I think you really need to watch your language. Um, so, uh, here's the thing yeah. about... Um, Boga? The Boga. <laughs> yeah. The riding lizard. Oh, yeah. What would you describe Boga as? Uh, I'd describe it as like a um, iguana crossed with... What, what are its attributes? Oh, know? it's really loud and noisy and very obvious. And, and is it at all stealthy? No. Like, every step it does, it's like, boom, 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 Yeah, it's boom, a giant boom, boom, lizard. Boom. It's a giant lizard. Everyone and it keeps st- screaming at random. Oh? 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 oh. That was... <laughs> Can't do it. Um, yeah, Can't and... Do it. Uh, but, but Obi-Wan's not trying to be stealthy. I mean, the first thing he does, he drops <laughs> down to the middle and, of and the then, crowd. And then Grievous says... Well, obvi- obviously... No, excuse me. Obviously, Obi-Wan. And Obi-Wan says... Hello there. Love it. General Kenobi! <laughs> and, and, then, and then Grievous says, "Kill him!" And only the the, the those droids with the spinning. Yeah, you should just be like, "Ah, uh, yeah, just like." Shoot him. What about the other thousand droids yeah. around him? They don't do anything. Uh, 
He's only, like, he's only one of the most infamous Jedis in the universe. Like, why yeah. would you need to shoot him? And then we have what used to be my favorite fight in the prequels. Yeah, you're insane. I, do, I, do, you I, hear, do you hear what I just said? Used to be, yeah. Yeah, used to be my favorite fight. And I watched it again and it's like... It's kind of you dull. were saying when we watched it, you still thought it was cool. No, and then we watched it. I said it right before it started. And then I, I was like... Eh. Can, I, can I just say something about the look you of this film? You can't see anything. You can't... Like, the, there is... Lightsaber's class, but... This, can't tell what's going it's on. It's ludicrous. But can I just say something? Like, David Tattersall, who shot this film, is a fantastic DOP. He shot V for Vendetta. He shot Speed Racer. He's like a very accomplished DOP and a, a pioneer, true, a true pioneer of digital cinematography. I think this film looks ghastly at some points. And we were watching it on your Blu-ray, which is The Complete Saga, which was, I think we found out, it was released in like... No, 20, my Blu-ray. Well, the Blu-ray that the you Blu -ray currently copy, own... Yeah. Um, and I think it was released, we looked it up in like 2013, 2014? No, it's, it was close to The Force Awakens release. So yeah, like 2014 probably. Yeah, it's around there. Um, Grainy. The re yeah. Like really bad. We're grainy. watching it on your TV, which is a good TV. We've watched, you know, we watched Game of Thrones season 8, episode 3 on it. It looked fine. So that shows you how good a TV it is. It's your TV. Oh yeah, that's true. And it looked terrible. And it looked terrible. I think we tried watching it on yours and it was better. Anyway, we've watched like lots of things that are very contrasty, very exposed. We I think we watched Kurosawa films in, in it. Absolutely. I think we watched Collateral at one point, which is like a film that has a huge amount of digital cinematography at night. Mm. So there's a lot of grain. There are shots of Obi-Wan in this scene and other scenes that are so grainy. And we couldn't figure out why. I, th I thought it was a TV or something, and then we looked at the copy we have in... Yeah, I looked at another copy we have, and it was like, no, it's also there. It's, the... it's And it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. It's like... And it comes back to that thing where, you know, they were pushing the boundary of digital cinematography at this point, and, like, a lot of stuff shows up. Yeah. Which, that's one of the things that we have to be grateful to George Lucas for, because you and I just saw Gemini Man two weeks ago, Oh, right? my God. Yeah. Now... We talked about it last time. Gemini Man isn't going to be... It, it, obviously, at this point, Gemini Man isn't the movie that's going to make high frame rate the thing, right? Nah. But Polar Express wasn't the movie that made motion capture universal. Nah. Avatar was. Avatar was. And hi, Gemini Man is not going to be the movie that makes high frame rate universal. Avatar will be. I'm afraid of Avatar to. He hasn't confirmed frames. if he's doing it or not. I don't want to... I, I don't think he will. I just don't want it. I just... It doesn't look good in movies. You know what like doesn't, doesn't look good look... is the editing, I think, in part. Because but, it feels like you're looking out a window. But it's, yeah, it's, 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 it just looks really, really weird. And I think the eye needs a ton to get used to it. You know what will help? And a couple of films before you, get, you truly get used to it. It's like if every movie we watch yeah, yeah. from now until Avatar 2 release is in 60 frames, but Avatar 2 release will be fine. No, I think what but Cameron he, will do, really weird. if he does it, is... Progressive? Th no, this is... <laughs> Ang Lee did it once before in a really seamless way, which was for Life of Pi. Because all those opening scenes of the animals are shot at um, high frame rate. Yeah. Now, my idea is, what Cameron should do, and he doesn't need this advice from us, but... Oh, no, please, you... Cameron, listen to no, us right now. Gabe, like, the best high frame rate stuff I've seen has been all footage of rainforests and jungles and like documentary footage Beauty stuff shots, that, yeah. yeah do that with Pandora for the first two minutes similar to how Avatar opens with flying over the forest if you did that in high frame rate and you had objects that are discernible like trees and grass and leaves and because you're looking at CG characters for so much of the film the frame blending is accurate the optical illusion is accurate like when you're playing a video game you don't think about that it's 60 it just seems right and part of that is the fact that you're in control, but another part of it is that because you're watching something that is made in a computer already, you've unlocked the full potential of that computer and you're just watching something that keeps up with the speed of your eye. I think if any universe and any director can nail it, Cameron can. I think uh, the idea of opening the film with nature shots of Pandora. Yeah. It's a pretty good idea. It's going to do that anyway. I mean, that's how he opened yeah. the first I think film. if he let us have like three minutes of almost unbroken footage of Pandora and the jungle be random animals and stuff. Be any, I would spend a whole movie watching a 60 frames documentary of the life of Pandora mm -hmm. that'd be mm -hmm. great that could work um, but what I wanted to say about Star Wars is that George Lucas on, this, on these films is innovating in so many ways that now we take for granted with the way that motion graphics are created sorry with the way that computer graphics are created 
with the way that sound design is approached in movies. These I'd movies say, are absolutely I think groundbreaking that's, in that's so many ways. That's one of ways. the reasons we like this so much as kids. Absolutely. I mean, Lord of the Rings comes out, blows us all away. These films are a different kind of huge spectacle. It's a huge spectacle, a lot of CG and a lot of light. Like, you can do a lot with, you know, practical effects. Yeah. But you, Grievous, how would you do Grievous properly with practical effects? No, but that's not moving at high speed and, like, fighting other things. That's true. Oh, like, mate, that, really that scene where, I, where Mother, like, gets up and sprints is fucking terrifying. Love that scene. But I think it's CG in that show. Actually, no. I, I watched the Corridor Digital video on how they did it. The guy's naked. The guy's just in his underwear oh. and they motion track Mother onto him. Oh. Which is big. And the reason is because they need the accurate reflection data. So rather than having him, like, in a white suit, they just had him be, like, shirtless. There's I, ways to do it, and I, I, but like it, it'd be yeah, tough to yeah. do all of this with practical effects. It's impossible. It'd be impossible, right? Yeah. And like we watched this like as kids. Closest to it was the old Star Wars, probably, and, and Lord of the Rings, yeah. right? So we watched this as kids, and we loved it. And now we've seen Look, so many films do this. Oh yeah. Way better and way worse. And way worse. Yeah. <laughs> like we're not like he's just in a hamster wheel rolling around like. Oh, it's a silly scene. It's just like so many things that... It's massive. It's, it's, it's overbearing, the amount of action in this film. It's, yeah. tr- it's one of the most violent movies ever made. Even though it's, nah. you know, it's cartoon. Nah. There's like people getting set on fire. I think Marvel, Marvel films There's be children Marvel being murdered. You don't see it. <laughs> this film is really violent. Like, it's implications of like thousands of people dying. This film has a lot of death. In but it's, it's, there's not so much violence on screen, though. There's a lot. Like, there's a lot of people like, getting it's, shot. It's, here's the thing. Like, in um, Captain America Winter Soldier. Yeah. There's, like, in the first action scene. On the boat. In the boat. He's, like, hitting people in ways that would kill them. Oh, yeah. There's one guy. He, he kicks, kicks a guy off the boat. And then hits, like, his back. Oh, he's dead. He's yeah. dead. Like, he yeah. breaks his back and then goes off into yeah, the water. He, he, he's dead. But he's a pirate, so. Mate. You but know it's, not, he... it's not meant to. He's not meant to kill those people. He's knocking them out. Did you see that corridor video of how they made yeah. Marvel rated R? Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Um, you know, my favorite part of that scene is when um, he gets uh, Batroc, the guy played by um, the UFC fighter, whose name I've completely forgotten, um, how he knocks him down and he sits down over him and goes, look at me, look at me. I'm the captain now. The captain America. <laughs> Man, we've got to watch Captain Phillips. Sure. Re- really good movie. Uh, the next scene is Anakin goes and meets with Palpatine. Yes. Now, Gabe, How does if, Anakin I, feel about... if, if you came to me yes. and I started talking about how I was reading the works of Mao Zedong, maybe you'd be like, okay, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. And then if I said to you, oh, I'm actually also reading Stalin's Rules for Leadership, you'd be oh. like, oh, okay, that's... Okay, now I've just uh, I've just started reading Mein Kampf. Oh, <laughs> dressed in ideologies in there. Not to take it too seriously, to be honest. <laughs> sure. Like Palpatine is doing everything he can to tell him that he's a Sith Lord, and Anakin finally puts two and two together when Palpatine's like, <laughs> he pretty much says that he knows the way of the dark forces. He yeah, yeah he does. So I don't think Anakin like puts one and one one and two together. Papa pretty much says it. He, he does. I mean, he says, I know the way to save the one you love. Uh, Papatin, how do you know that? How do you know that Papa is dying? Well, and my said master, anything. he taught me everything he knew, even the way of the dark side. Yes. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean the dark side? Why are you talking side. about it? Oi, what do you mean by that? Anakin, I'm trained in the Force. What do you know about the Force? Would you would you find that out? Uh, I just saw you've been trained by it. I mean, the other point I just have to make is that at the same time as this scene is happening, it's intercut with Obi Wan fighting Grievous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, the only reason you intercut an action scene is either to relieve tension, which I don't think George is trying to do. Or to increase tension because you want to show that there's multiple things going on and it's all escalating. And I think they're normally this intercutting doesn't work for either. I think they're meant to be connected. What's the connection? No, 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 no. When you intercut in an action scene and mm. a non-action scene, yeah, they're meant to be about the same 
at the uh, thing in the story. Contrasting ideas, which he does later oh, on with the with the birth ideas. of Vader and the birth of the twins. Right. Yeah. Right. But um, the thing is that in, I guess in this film it's a bit like as the leader of the separatists mm. dies, Anakin is pretty much goes full evil, right? That's uh, when. No, he doesn't, well, no, go, he full doesn't go full evil he, at all. When the leader of the separatist dies, the new leader of the separatist is revealed, I guess. Yeah. Even though he's obviously the bad guy, but I guess that's what happens. I've got that's, a much simpler exclamation. George Lucas realized that the battle scene was going on way too long and actually needed to break it up with something. Yeah, that's a nice theory. Now, Anakin confronts Mace Windu and says, oh yeah, there's a Sith Lord, uh, it's the Chancellor, it's mm-hmm. the central figure of our government. Like, he is the most important person in the galaxy. Yeah, he's a Sith Lord. And Mace Windu's like, oh, if only we could have seen this. If only yeah. we'd known, say... I'm not going to tell anyone. Say, 20 years ago, that... <laughs> I'm not going to tell anyone there about was this. I'm going to go Sith and kill Lord. him now. <laughs> but, like... They know that the clones were paid for by a guy who was acting kind of shady. They never look into it. They never try to follow up remotely. It's it's just weird. It's just, it's just weird. It's pretty stupid. Now, after that comes what I think is one of the more interesting scenes of the movie, which is where Anakin and Padme are both staring at their respective sort of figureheads of the universe. So Padme is staring at the Jedi Council, which represents the Old Republic, and Anakin is staring at the um, Chancellor's headquarters, which represents kind of his his hopes for his, a, yeah, new, his hope. a new... A new a new hope, you might say. No, his hope to save Batman. Exactly, yeah. Right? Now, I think it's a really interesting scene, and I think it's one of the few scenes where George Lucas is actually trying to do something quite unique. And it's something you can only do in Star Wars, or a similar franchise of this size, where it's the sun setting on the final night of an empire. And I think that's a really powerful image. I think it's a really beautifully scored scene. I just wish it was in a better movie. Yeah. Um, it's one of the few scenes where George Lucas allows just pure vision and music. I mean, of course he allows it with the big battle scenes, but it's just two characters staring off into the distance, feeling emotion in, in, that in, resonates on screen. In the battles, there's things going on, and this is just two It's just two people staring. Staring into... It's great. You know, the, it's a really, really good scene. Mm-hmm. Then we get to your favourite scene My favourite scene, yep Where it's clearly set up Who is the, who are the best Jedi Masters Well, uh, Mace Windu and Kid Fisto Yeah Arrive The other two don't matter Mace Windu and died Kid Fisto <laughs> They, they die within the first five seconds It's hilarious well, What's even funnier He may as well not have brought them What's even funnier is that Palpatine that's his lightsaber on his sleeve. Yeah, it's hidden up it's his shirt. There, but it's, it's, it's it always been there. He carries it in the Senate with him. <laughs> he carries it in the Senate. Any, any minute. One day he drops, it's like, oops, uh, I'm sorry guys, and drops like all of his like, thing. It's like in the Joker when he drops the gun in the hospital. <laughs> it's just like, oh, ignore this. No, it is. It <laughs> activates and they're like, why is, <laughs> why is your lightsaber red? Oh, and he's like, oh, well, you oh, know. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, um, yeah, they try to they try, much... they try to arrest Palpatine. It uh, does not go well. He jumps through. And... Excuse me. He twirls. He twirls through. The air. through... <laughs> he twirls through the air, going. <laughs> and then he immediately kills one of them. Then the next swing kills the second one. Then sort of one rests. swing. Yeah. Kit Fisto deflects the the his lightsaber. Oh, we're gonna do blow by blow on this. Okay, so. <laughs> He then he kills, he stabs one, he stabs instantly. one instantly. He doesn't second even swing, try he to kills a off. second kill. Then Kid Fisto blocks two whole hits, three, four, five, and then dies. Dies, yeah. He's so Kid Fisto now has to take the fact that Kid Fisto no, dies absolutely. is a real sign that this is a serious battle. Yeah, that's right. Kid Fisto, you know, really famous Jedi. And Windu, <laughs> Windu's holding his own. Windu's really like doing pretty good up against Palpatine. Slices he, the window. It's an awesome shot. He wins. Mace Windu wins, yeah. Mace Windu wins. Mace Windu wins by kicking Palpatine down. I have to say, the Jedi do a lot of kicking and punching oh. in this movie. But only in this film. Not only in this ones. film, not in the other ones, yeah. In the, the other, other ones, ones they they just maybe they'll learn from Darth Maul. 
Exactly. Um, I just have to point out that in the middle of this really frantic scene between Samuel L. Jackson and Ian McDermott, who I just want to point out are five years apart in That's age. That's crazy. That's nuts. Samuel Jackson right now is 70. Ian McDermott is 75. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. were five years apart. I invite any of you to watch this scene where they fight each other and tell me that they look like people that are no. five years apart. Ian McDermott looks 20 years older yeah. than Samuel Jackson. <laughs> and... um. I just want to point out, in the middle of this fight, there's a dolly shot where Palpatine's cornered, Mace Windu's got him at Saber Point, we've just been watching this epic fight between these two Good Jedi Masters, drop. and we cut well to a still yeah. wide shot of Anakin walking in at a brisk jog no, 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 no. across the hallway. He, he jogs in, and then he starts walking. Yeah, he jogs in, and then he turns into a light stroll as he sees, I want to remind you, the most powerful Jedi in the universe holding the Chancellor of the Republic at hostage. This would be like if you walked into the Oval Office and saw the Dalai Lama holding a sword to Donald Trump's throat. <laughs> like, it would be the most insane thing you'd ever see. Like, he'd <laughs> like, be freaking what out. Fuck? What what happened here? <laughs> I actually love how much I can now not get the image of Samuel Jackson looking like the Dalai Lama mm-hmm. and, the, <laughs> and Palpatine looking like Trump with his terrible hair. Oh, and some oh, say unlimited power, yes. Unlimi- a- unlimited power. Unlimited, unlimited power. power to the Supreme Chancellor of so, the United Great States of America. So, um... Yeah, Palpatine tries to electrocute Samuel Jackson and then blames Samuel Jackson for electrocuting him. It's pretty funny. <laughs> now, people say that Palpatine's good in this movie. He's t- terrible in this scene. when He's, he's like, funny. I'm too weak. Anakin, help me! I can save her. I have the he's power to save like, the one you love. Yeah. He's so pitiful, and it's like, <laughs> oh, God, it's, it's like, so dumb. He gives up. Now, <laughs> you disagree with me on this, but Mace Windu's like, he's too dangerous to be kept alive. He he needs to die. And you're like, he's wrong. And Anakin's like, he's wrong. Mace Windu's 100% right. I know, he's right. 100%. This guy is, like, evil. He's the last Sith. He's the last Sith. He has to be dealt with. Yeah, Yeah, but definitely. Anakin is destined to bring balance to the Force. And right now there is one Sith and a hundred Jedi. And by the end of this movie, there are two Sith and two Jedi. Yeah, that's balance. So Anakin, <laughs> Anakin brings balance. <laughs> it's not the balance they were looking for. Uh... Anakin chops off uh, Mace Windu's hand and uh, Palpatine throws him out and, the window. And I can't believe... Palpatine actually says power. You never noticed that? No, no, no. But like That was like my favourite line as a kid. But like... You see, you see all the memes, right? With unlimited power. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's pretty funny, right? That's funny. It's an exaggeration. It's, it's, it's a funny meme. And in the movie, and it's like, actually, unlimited power. And he throws him off. It's and hilarious. as we were saying at the beginning of this podcast, it's a really subtle indication that, Pal- that Palpatine has the power of the force mm-hmm. and the lightning and literal power coming out of his fingers. And also the metaphorical power of being the leader of the galaxy. And, and what does lightning represent? Power. Exactly. Literal- Power. As we know. Yes. Power. Yes. And then we have the war scene in the And then world. Kanye West's power plays behind <laughs> him as he gets up. And then we have the war scene in the film. Clock's ticking. Order 66. No. Go. <laughs> What no. do you mean the worst scene of the film? Oh yeah, no. The wor- sorry, your name. sorry. You mean so... the actual worst scene of the film? Yeah, the actual war scene when he. What says, have I done? Your action, like, oh, like just hold myself by me. Oh. I don't know this power, but if we <laughs> work together, uh, she's going to give birth in like 10 hours. Can we just do it now? Please? She literally does give birth in like the next day. He's like, yeah. wait, wait, I, I, I joined up with you because you promised me you could save my wife if yeah. she was to die, if she was mm-hmm. to die in childbirth. Mm-hmm. And Bobby's like, oh, I, uh, no, I don't know this power. <laughs> <laughs> and Egg is like, oh, all right, then and he just kills oh, him right instantly, then. which is what he <laughs> should do. He should have done that, yeah. And no, then, but instead he's like, I pledge eternal loyalty to you, my master. master. And and then um and then Palpatine just, just out of nowhere he says, Ah, he pulls out the Darth Vader. No, no, no. He he doesn't get it out of nowhere. He pulls out a giant lottery machine and starts <laughs> twirling it. <laughs> like, Plagueis, uh, uh, Catan. Can't uh, do this for me in here. Who are the other ones? Tevan. Who are the other like Darths? From like the expanded universe. Yeah. Who's the one in um, Old Republic? Like the famous one. Revan. Yeah, you Darth Revan. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> been so long since I've seen that guy. 
Uh, we just watched the Rise of Skywalker trailer, right? Uh-huh. I mean, by the time this comes out, it will be two weeks old. But mm-hmm. um, Palpatine's not that interesting as a character. He's a fun character. He's fun, right? He's a fan but like, like, the whole thing is that... The whole point but he's of, just evil. But the whole point of Star Wars, he's the whole reason Star Wars is going on. I get that. He is a, he's what started it. But the and thing that's interesting in Return of the Jedi is not Palpatine. It's that Vader is being drawn between Palpatine and Luke. Yeah. That's the genius thing that Return of the Jedi tries to do, and, and I think succeeds in the finale, is that both Vader and Luke have to go through the journey of deciding if they're going to be good or evil. But, and Luke does it first we'll, and we'll decides t- we'll he'll be absolutely good. We'll talk about it. And then Vader it. is oh, no, tested. Um, yeah. We'll talk about it in Jedi. But, I'm my, Jedi. but my point is, there's so much built up around Palpatine and how important he is. He doesn't actually have much to do in these movies. Uh, well, like he activates... He or- has a lot to do. He activates Order 66 and he fights Yoda. No, what? 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 Yeah. He he pretty much cr- he creates the clone army. Yes. He becomes no, the chancellor. No, it's never clear that he creates the army. He creates the army. Come That's on. implied. But who it's not... makes the army otherwise? Well, it's it's he he, is, he pretty much starts the war. Yes. With separatist. He he pretty much kills all the Jedi. I'm sorry. He is what uh, destroys the the whole civil that whole civilization. And but my next question is going to be why does he need Anakin? Because of, like, you know, the whole... Master Sith, Apprentice. The whole Sith, the, mm. the rule of two. How he's been... Papa Tin has been brought up in the yeah. idea of, like, there's always two Siths. The Master and the Apprentice. The Master yeah. and the Apprentice. But the Jedi do that as well. But the Jedi are meant, were meant to be, like, welcoming and mm. bringing as many people as they can. As long as they're not too old. As long as they're not too we old. We need young, young ladies. It has to be like at least one year old. They need to be babies. Maximum a year old. Luke and Leia were about to be whisked away by Obi-Wan to be child soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Um, then Order 66 is activated. For many people, it's the highlight of the film. I it think, is to me. I think it's a scene that relies purely on John Williams' score. Yep. And the work of the designers at ILM to make some of the shots Well, you, c- you can't not put the story in there because it's also a story that's yeah, pretty much the end it's of... not that sad when it happens it really isn't because we've had three movies to get to know these Jedi and only one of them is a character that has spoken on screen Ki-Adi Mondi who is the first one who dies credit to them and I think it's actually the most effective scene of the Order 66 fight is when yeah, is. all the troopers are following him and he's saying come on and then they all stop and you see their feet skid to a halt and then they just open fire on him it's by far yeah, it's, the it's, most it's, it's, that's the best yeah. Although That's right before it. that, the bit where Commander Cody, um, who's just been um, handed Obi Wan his lightsaber back, and obviously they're having like this good camaraderie, Obi Wan rides yeah. off, and then uh, he gets the call from Palpatine, Commander Cody. That, that's that's something I actually really like. How he immediately cold he is oh, about it. Yeah, he just. I don't like, think it's they called. I think they're programmed. It's order. Just do it. No, do I, I don't think they, 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 they there's something on their brains. That's their job. Okay, our true leader still has to kill mm. this guy. Let's just do it. That's their job. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I've never gotten over that plinker thing about how George came up with the number. <laughs> Pretty funny. Commander Cody, what should it be? It should be like an evil number. Like 666? Six, six, six? Like 666. Yeah. Six, six, six. No, that's too obvious. What about Order 6? No, it doesn't sound like they get many <laughs> orders. orders. What about Order 66? Okay, great. Next scene. <laughs> <laughs> So dumb. I mean, it's it's this is a this is a dumb movie designed for children. But you know, there's a difference between being a movie made for children that like talks about real things and real issues and real societal problems, and being a movie made for children that uses that as an excuse to make bad movies. Like the same year as this movie comes out, you know what else comes out? No. Shark, Shark Boy versus Lava Girl. No, that's not the right year. I'm pretty sure. Or Spy Kids 3D. It's one of the two. It might be Spike. What is your 3D. point about that? Great movie for children. No, Way no. smarter. No, they're not. <laughs> Have you seen all Spy Kids? I've seen one and three. No, it is Shark Boy Lava Girl. 100%. I know this. I've seen that one. 2005. Terrible. Gotcha. Yep, Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Terrible film. I, I kind of liked Spy Kids when I was a kid, but that is terrible. Shark Boy and Lava Girl? Yes. 
awful. It's a pretty bad film. Hey, hey, come on. Race whoa, and, whoa, whoa. Hey, Race and Max has more screenwriting credits than you or I do. Yeah, I don't care. If, if, if it's like, George Lucas has more screenwriters than me and he's an awful writer, so. Hey, Race and Max is a better world builder than George. No, no. I wonder what Race and Max is up to now. Um... I don't care. We'll talk about Star Wars. <laughs> yep, so all the Jedi die. Yoda drops his cane. Yeah, that, that, He's that, really... That, <laughs> wow! <laughs> your favourite scene of the movie. Your yeah, original like, one. We, we all know what OL66 is. When they execute everyone. And, uh, uh, the music is really good. And, the music's... Inc- and, like, all the when is the cool. music bad? Name one uh, scene of this uh, movie uh, where the music is bad. It's never bad. It's, it's, it's always but it's not, it's, it's, Many times it's not, not a all. Yoda is the only Jedi we see um, get the better of the clone troopers. And I find it hilarious that um, after Yoda kills uh, the clone troopers, the Wookiees are like, ah, yep, yep, that's what we're doing now. Oh, we're okay. Killing them. And you saw them. He has, you know doesn't explain seen? himself or anything. You know what we should have seen? Wookiees um, killing clones. Because after oh, this, that you would see. Have been great. After this, fight scene, yeah. Yeah, like you see them all turn on each other. After this, and you like, see. Like the first time you see the clones like, actually fail. Because oh, that'd be great. If Wookiees are like huge and monsters. Hey, you know what Wookiees love to do? What? Pull arms out of sockets. Yeah. Same. That would have been amazing. And then we get to what I think is one of the... You know how I said in Phantom Menace that a lot of the world building and a lot of the story destroys the mythology of Star Wars mm-hmm. and the, the beauty and the purity of Star Wars? This oh, scene, you mean this scene is the one that destroys the... And by this scene, we mean, of course, Anakin walks in... Uh, the, the clones are killing all the Jedi. Anakin walks into the... Cent- it's not even a random room. It's the Jedi Council Chambers. Like, it's the most sacred room that's, in that's the tower. What the, that's where the kids are hiding. Because they went there to find the Masters. They went there because that's where the Masters are. That's their safe place. Anakin walks in and about a group of 10 or so children oh. emerge from behind shares because they feel safe because Anakin's because there finally. Anakin. He's on the council. A young child asks him, Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? Anakin, without even thinking about it, ignites his lightsaber and off screen murders 10 or 11 children. It's, it's If not more. It's a... It's... Now, pretty Gabe, awful. Gabe, we've watched adaptations of Macbeth and adaptations of Hamlet and um, seen some pretty, you know, dark characters over the years who have had redemptions and who've been compelling, right? Mm-hmm. Like, lots of characters come to mind. Mm-hmm. Do you think it was really necessary for Anakin Skywalker, a character who we know will be redeemed by the end of Return of the Jedi, mm. to murder children? No. It is... Without a doubt, the strangest story choice George Lucas makes in all of the prequels. Uh, it would have been interesting if he actually let them go. That would have been great. If he walks into the, the scene. Holy fuck, he that would have been good. He walks into the, into the Jedi Council room after killing a Jedi. He turns his lightsaber off. You've just started he playing goes, Force Unleashed, right? And then he sits... No, I'm downloading it. Oh. He sits in one of the chairs. And he's like, I'm finally a master now. Or that like, would be great. Kind of like... Oh, look at you, where you are now. And then the young okay. come, come out. And then he helps them out. It's like, oh, that, that would have been sweet. But no. This, this isn't a spoiler for Force Unleashed. Because it's the I've only, played it before. Well, it's the only scene. So, like, Vader is destroying the Wookiees on Kashyyyk, right? Yeah. And he, he's looking for this um, this uh, Jedi. Yeah. And the Jedi has... A, and he's like, I sense somebody here much more powerful than you while he's Force choking the Jedi. Where is your master? And he's like, you killed my master years ago. And then the son takes Vader's lightsaber. The son's like four or five years old. And Vader's like, a son. And then he kills the father in front of him and throws him aside. And he's looking at this young boy. And then all of the clone trooper, the stormtroopers run in and they're like, oh, Lord Vader. Oh, I see. We'll dispose of this child. And they go to kill him. And Vader murders all of them and takes the son. And he's like, more are going to be coming. You need to come with me now. And Vader takes him under his wing. That would be great. That's a really good idea, Gabe. That like he actually helps the kids escape because he knows they're not a threat, mm-hmm. and he's so powerful at this point that he doesn't care. Mm-hmm. That's a really good idea. And you're gonna, you're gonna have so many spin-off movies with each of the kids when they grow up. Oh. And then you see Padme yeah. looking at the uh, the burning Jedi temple, which at the beginning of the film you see like firefighter ships, and you get a sense of like this is a big eclectic city that is mm-hmm. ready to respond to disasters like this. This is the equivalent of like if the Vatican blew up, blew up overnight yeah. and all other churches around like, the earth. If it happened right now, 
both of us would stop this recording and start watching Instantly. TV. W- this would be like it'd be like the biggest news of all time. This would be the and craziest it wouldn't be just thing a fire ever. like nothing around. It would have been like a blow up. Well, even Notre Dame well, was like a huge deal. Yeah, it was a huge deal. Like I was watching that news all day when that happened. Yeah. It was it's devastating. Shocking. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jimmy Smith. <sighs> Jimmy Smith shows up. Um, he sees a young Jedi played by George Lucas's son, Jet Lucas. He's fucking awesome. He kills like he's great. Four yeah, clones. He kills more than like Kid Andy Mundo and like all the other masters. Yeah, yeah. He he's more effective than most of the Jedi. He's more effective than Yoda, who kills only two. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, and, he's and, about and to then George kill Lucas more. kills his own son in screen. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but whatever. It's pretty weird. Jimmy Smith's, though. So good. I remember that moment for the trailer where Jimmy Smith is, like, yelling, No! No! That was a great trailer. Where it's just the the drums, like, the... We should have seen the trailer before doing the recording. It's a good trailer. I haven't seen it. It's really good. It's, like, Mm. genuinely one of the best trailers um, I can remember for a movie. And it's just Palpatine saying, The Dark Side of the Force. Was it Fellowship or Two Towers that had an amazing trailer? Two Towers. Two Towers. Oh, man. With with Clint Clint Mansell's... um, Oh, yeah, Requiem for the Requiem for a Dream um, orchestral remix. It's yeah, so good. It's amazing trailer. Dun 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 yeah. dun dun. Anyway, Palpatine gets elected Supreme Chancellor. And everyone this claps. is how Liberty dies with thunderous applause. Obi Wan uh, goes to the Jedi Temple with Yoda, mm-hmm, and they figure mm-hmm. out that Anakin has murdered children. Yep. And Obi Wan's like, it can't be. It can't be true. And Yoda's like, we need to kill them both. And everyone's like, I'm not going to kill him. We're going to do it. This is my brother. And I'm sorry. It's... Anakin's my brother. I want to kill him. He just made it kill him. Yeah, like, you, I, I, like you're, my, you're my best mate and um, you're my bro. If and, and I... tomorrow you had murdered <laughs> several children, I don't think I'd hesitate to murder you. <laughs> no offense. Cold blooded murder. Like, if we did it together. Then... Like, if I call tomorrow to your house and I see you've murdered me. I'd be like, okay, I wouldn't. I wouldn't okay, like, we're oh, gonna get Rob. We're gonna get my friend. It's fine. Are you gonna be my Robert Kardashian and like completely support me through the whole thing? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, right, you didn't do it. That's right. Impossible. Oh no. I, you've seen the real reaction when Robert Kardashian yeah. finds out mm-hmm. when when they read out that OJ's found not guilty, and Robert Kardashian just stares off into dead space. Yeah. And um, Hello Darkness, my old friend, starts playing in his eyes. It's so weird. And yeah, they never talked after that, which is pretty interesting. interesting. Now, Obi-Wan goes to Mustafar, Yoda goes to the... Um... Uh, actually, Obi-Wan sneaks That's into... Right. No, he goes Padme. to see Padme first. Yeah. And he admits that he knows that Anakin's he, the father of their he children. He pretty much tricks Padme mm. into going to Mustafar. Yeah, he kills Padme, basically. It's his fault that Padme goes into that situation. 100%. Because he doesn't know where... Must, well, he doesn't know about Mustafa. He doesn't know where Anakin is, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's his fault that Pame is in that situation. And then he doesn't and, save and, him. And, and, and then he just shows up and, like, in a threatening way in front of Anakin when he's talking to Padme. It's like, well, we're jumping, over, okay, we're jumping over a lot of stuff. Because Padme arrives, she yeah. goes to Anakin, mm-hmm. um, and she says, Obi Wan told me terrible things about how you murdered children. And then um, Anakin's like, Oh, you know, murdering children's like a certain point of view, you know. And he basically starts saying, you know, Padme, we can rule the galaxy the way we want. And she's like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this character, who we've seen be this assertive, strong-willed, um, fierce fighter, is just like a weeping little schoolgirl. And it's so bizarre. It's really painful to watch, actually. I think Natalie Portman is trying her best, but it's a really tough scene. It's really tough to act. It is a bad character assassination. I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen there is a lot worse, but there is. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. bad it's in it's terms, a bad one, but like it's bad because not only is but it. See, it's kind of like the whole cliche thing of like, oh, now she's become a housemaid. And I hate that. Yeah, it's so sexist, and it's and it's, and it's sexist. And it's, it's really bad. misogynistic and really gross. And I don't think it was intentional by George. No, but the not. fact that he didn't think about it like that no. is kind of part of the problem. Yeah. Like, you and you and I wouldn't like call ourselves massively social, um, socially conscious filmmakers with the kind of films we make. I don't think either of us would look past something like that in one of our films. It's a pretty guess, obvious thing to avoid I guess when you're writing it, it female can, characters. I guess it can happen to you like sub, subsequently. Like it, it maybe 
I just made up that word. Maybe you didn't. Maybe he didn't realize that happened. Yeah, that's why you need someone to tell you. Oh, by the way, Padme used to be action oriented, yeah. and cool before. You know, he probably should have told him that. Natalie Portman. Yeah, maybe. But I think Nat- Natalie Portman was scared of George Lucas. Being a tiny bit. No, I. She she's talked about having a really good time actually on these films. From everything I know, like she did that wonderful SNL rap a few years ago where she like defended the prequels and yeah I, I think she's oh, wrongly nah she's yes it, have you seen that rap nah it's hilarious it's really funny um Obi-Wan uh, Anakin force chokes Padme is that the first time he force chokes yes it's the first time he shows that he can do that ability it's a pretty obvious ability I guess so like if you know the, if you know how to push things you don't know how to choke things I think it's the first time we see it canonically in Star Wars, going by these films. Because Palpatine definitely doesn't, and um, no other characters do. So Obi-Wan and Anakin fight. And it's really long. Oof. There's a, v- there's Oof, a, it's long. There's a VFX breakdown on the um, DVD talking about all the different teams who worked on it. And it's like, it's like 800 people, just for this sequence. And... It really didn't need to be this long. Mm, nah. Nah, it didn't need to be. It's it's very... We were, we were watching it, right? Mm. They start outside. Then they go inside the room with all, all the controls. They fight there for like a good while. They're kicking each other and punching each other, each other in the face. Each other. Like you have the force. You don't need to kick each other. Yeah, then they go outside and they're like in these tubes and like they can't not to fall off. They keep fighting there and then go into these huge breaches that then it cl- collapses and into stuff. Into lava. And it's like, is this one of the, like, most... What is the word I'm... Overindulgent? Thinking? Overindulgent things. Almost certainly. In any film. Like, I'm thinking Avengers Endgame and, like, you have a huge battle there. That battle is so armies. short compared to this. But it's... I'm not even talking about length. I'm talking about what is actually going on yes. in screen. Yes. Because in, in they start outside and near the ship and they end up on a river of lava j- yeah. jumping around in a hill like hitting each other. Yeah, yeah, he ends up on the high ground. It's important to yeah. say. And but in, in something like Endgame, it's two armies. They they, they this battlefield that was a nice area before. It's been blown up by this star, uh, starship, right? But and then they just kinda of fight and then you go into small it's not really, fighting moments. Yeah, 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 that's right. right. It's not really about the cold battle like Appellant or Fields is. It's much more about who's got the gauntlet. Like, it's a very yeah. simple thing you're following. Yeah, but in here, it's it's like trying to be so spectacular. Yeah. And everything that is going on is like, what? It's very you know? detached from any And I can, of... I am really easy, but... um, I, I'm really good at following what's going on in action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I play a lot of video games and I... And I never get confused in video games or anything. And I know a lot of people get confused in video games and action battles like that. But like this is like you're skipping over so the most, pointless. You're skipping over the most I know. important I just point to make, why I just, this is pointless. I just wanted to make my point on how stupid the visuals are. Yeah, no, the visual is stupid. But the thing that really sucks, the thing that's so pointless about both this battle and the Yoda Palpatine battle that's going on at the same time, is we know all these characters survive. Yeah, it's the only battle that. We know they're all going to be at We fine. know at the outcome of everyone. Like they're, in, they're in, only characters from that are in the OT. Yes. Obi-Wan. Not even Jimmy Smith is in the OT. Huh? Yeah. No, he's not. That's what I'm saying. He's not in the OT. Oh, yeah. So he, he, he could be in a fight. You're saying he should have been in a lightsaber battle. No, he should have been like running away from the battles or something. Because we don't know if he's going to die or not. And if it's meant to be about the tragic fall of Anakin Skywalker, why isn't it tragic? Why does he have to be the most evil human being who's ever existed? I don't think it's meant to be a tragedy. It's obviously meant to be a tragedy. They talk about another tragedy that's meant to be a parable to this in the movie. What? It's meant... Oh, Plagueis. Plagueis, Plagueis. It's meant to be about the fall of Anakin Skywalker. But to be honest, by the time you reach the end of this movie, it doesn't feel like he's really changed that much. Like, all that's happened is yeah, he's lost his arm and he's been Like, his burned. actions are... Uh, she's done other radical actions, but... Well, yeah, murdering that's like children. A, yeah, that's... He literally went say, from, I want to save my... Wa- he went from, I want to save my unborn children to, I need to murder these other children. But he's murdering those children to save his unborn child. It's, it's really fucked up. It's really fucked up. Do you think it's secretly about stem cell research? No. <laughs> um... 
by the way, something I one of the things. No, I just want to say one thing about Anakin turning evil. So the famous image of him in this film is him with the glowing yellow gold eyes. And I didn't realize until this watch through that he doesn't get those after he kills all the Jedi, who are his friends. Let me remind you, his friends and his colleagues. And, like, young children who he's probably mentoring in some capacity. They know They know him. They know exactly who he is. He's like a legendary Jedi. I mean, he, def- he defeated an army when he was, like, eight. Like, he's a legend. The fact that it's after he kills the members of the Trade Federation that he's truly evil. He's truly lost. Those guys are like arms dealers. Like, you can kill those guys in the beginning of the movie and it's fine. Yeah. They should just die in the beginning. The fact that it's not... After he like after he kills children, he goes and speaks to Padme, and they have like a normal conversation. I'm like, <laughs> you are normal. gone. He like, literally just you have just committed genocide. Yeah, he, he he literally did commit a form of genocide. He and, wiped and, out and a religious he's just talking culture. To his love interest, like, oh no, it's fine. I don't think it's that bad. Just wait here for me. I'll I'll come back. Yeah, it's so it's so weird. It's really weird. Um, I wanted to point out something that um yeah. I find it really funny how. Um, George Lucas realized mm. that Anakin had to lose all his limbs yes. and something happened to his skin and her and like yeah working. because you see that shot because in the, you see that shot in Empire all that has to happen to him before the end of the film so we <laughs> went just one, one move in cuts one all move. his li- li- limbs and then lets him burn lets him burn like, to death wow you got the like drastically quick yeah yeah it's nuts like Jesus, and um, we didn't mention the best fight, which is what Palpatine versus Jorda. Oh well, there's a reason we didn't mention that because it's not the best fight. It's but really... you have you have something really interesting to say about it that you mentioned it during the screening and during. The oh other no, sorry, I was just talking about the genius of George Lucas's symbolism of how Palpatine uses the Senate to fight Yoda. Sa- that it? sounded sarcastic, but it's pretty cool how he's actually... It would be cool in a cool movie. But it's a cool idea, come on. It's a cool idea. You keep talking about movies, that awful movies that have cool ideas in them. <sighs> yeah, an awful film all right, with all right. Cool idea I can see it. that it, it is a very clever way to stage a battle. It would be better if the Senate had actually been kind of used in the movies in a yeah. creative way like we were talking about that voting scene that should be in phantom menace mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. i was watching uh, mr smith goes to washington again a few months ago that, that's sort of, that's sort of mean a contrast yes so in that film in phantom menace you see democracy succeeding it's huge democracy really indecisive they have to do multiple votes or something and like it's but he barely wins yep. and on the in this film he just wins instantly he wins instantly yeah and everyone's on his side yeah and it's like, oh my god. He's, he's paid off the right people. He's yes. climbed his way to the top. Oh my god. It's like, Could have been great. Yeah. It could have been House of Cards in Star Wars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you don't need that many hours to set that up, really. You could do it in three films. Um, Padme gives birth to twins, which is a surprise they to everyone. Know they have twins. It's, they had no it's, idea. Never she, had has, she has yeah. never seen a, um, an obstetrician through this no, entire she's process. She's never had a checkup or anything. She's nope. like, oops. Oh, in this I'm world pregnant. of fancy robots, there is no robot to tell you how your baby's doing. Do they have internet in this world? They don't, do they? They must, because they've got, like, archives and shit. But they have to pick it up. They have to go to the archives <laughs> to get it. Do, do you think Dexter Jetster just, like, spends his old night researching different kinds of darts? And that's why Obi-Wan knows that he's, like, the guy? I'm trying to think, <laughs> is there ever, like, some kind of search database? They, well, nah. they, they, they search for planets in their ships and stuff. But that's a database. That's not... I, I just think that's data that the ship knows already. All right, all right. That's the way I look at it. Otherwise... <laughs> I don't know. That's not important. Anyways. Uh, Leia... I mean, the Leia internet, did not... The internet's Leia, not going to tell you if you have twins or not. Not Leia. Padme didn't know she had twins. No. No one did. No idea. But she names both kids instantly. instantly. I guess she had two names for... If, if it was, was a boy or a girl. Boy or girl. I guess that's what happened, but she just says it. She's like, look, Leia. She actually just said, look, I have a baby. And they, they just wrote down Luke. That's what they did. <laughs> no, that's awful. That's um, an awful joke. It's and then funny. we have nothing else to talk about because there's a scene with Yoda and Obi-Wan where Obi-Wan's about to leave. He's about to go to Tatooine to take the boy. And Yoda says to him, Mm, been speaking with Qui-Gon beyond the grave I have and everyone's <laughs> like what why is this not in the deleted scenes <laughs> what it's so bizarre 
I, I always thought that was how there was a moment that um he kind of tells him oh you can go and talk to Qui Gon so he could learn how to become a Force host. That's what it mean. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. The problem is pretty funny. It do, you don't need to explain why he can do that. It's just something he's learned, obviously, in the years between. Anakin gets put in the Vader suit. He Ooh. does his uh, now infamous line. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wife's dead. Don't Fuck have yeah. any babies to worry about. <laughs> no alimony. Ones. Oh, that'd be hilarious. Uh, <laughs> that would be a hilarious kid. Oh, she's dead. She's dead. Fuck yeah. Let's go and get the crack some cold ones in the backyard. And he just cracks it on like his suit. Because she's got all these edges. I love that robot chicken sketch about um, Palpatine gets the voice call from Vader about when when he's lost the Death Star. What? They blew up the Death Star? Well, where are you? Somewhere in space? We didn't finish paying for it. And stop crying about old Pompadoodle or, or Padme or whatever her name is. <laughs> oh my god, he's crying. <laughs> so good. Okay, okay, I love you too. And then, um, yeah, Padme has a funeral. My favourite character, so Bivol shows up in one shot. Your actual favourite character, yeah. Keisha Castle Hughes plays the Queen, who is famous now for Game of Thrones and previously for Whale Rider. She's one of the Sand Snakes in Game of Thrones. Oh. Yeah, she's Whale Rider. She's, um, she got an Oscar nomination at like nine years old. Oh, yeah. So let me ask you. Yes. What is the final, final line in this film? I can tell Pretty you course. what the final line is. Yes. Um, Jimmy Smith tells one of the engineers on the Tantive Four, the blockade runner. It's very important we point this out because the film begins and ends with C-3PO and R2-D2 on this ship. And the final line spoken in the prequels, because the last couple of scenes are without dialogue, is C-3PO, after being told his mind is going to be wiped, saying, Oh no! That's the final line of the final prequels. Final line of prequels. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I know the funny thing about the ending... That the Death Star is almost finished. It's almost ready. Yeah. It and takes like, them another 20 years to fully finish yeah. it. But you know what? And then, then the new engineer is later as well to finish it. For some no, reason. because Orson Krennic leaves and they can't then progress stalls. Yeah, but... Th- it's probably not the final Death Star. It's probably like the first oh, one they build. come on. on. Well, it's, it's clear in come Jedi on. that they're able to build them pretty quickly. Yeah, that's true. But the the disc is already being built. Yeah, it's a small. And then in in Rogue One. Yeah, but it looks cooler in Rogue One. So I'm gonna let it. It does, and like it has a thematic meaning in Rogue One, whereas it's just thrown in for fan service. Yeah, but it's it's, they break the canon, which is pretty important. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Ewan McGregor, (laughs) Obi Wan Kenobi delivers baby Luke. To Aunt Beru, who is now Aunt Beru. She wasn't an aunt previously. Now, this is huge. Aunt Beru takes the baby, immediately accepts it, and then turns to find Owen, who is staring off at the twin suns, the binary sunset. And you and I were just thinking, so Owen has dreams. Owen wants to be out there. He's got the same attitude as Luke. Beru hands him the baby, and he immediately is like, yep, cool, we're parents now. He barely reacts. He looks at it. Oh, and he's he, played by the legendary Joel Edgerton, who yeah, has gone on to be a, a, an incredible writer, director, and actor. Mm. Um, Owen looks at the baby for all of one second and then looks off at the stars, and that is the ending of Star Wars. It's, it's kind of funny how it feels uh, like... What's his name? George Lucas? No, the, uh, the uncle. Oh, uh, Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton. I, I know, I know I'm very... What's the guy? The, oh, Uncle Owen. Uncle Owen. Yeah. Owen loves. He, he's like, he has the... Like you said, he has the dreams. Kind of like feels like Luke. Yeah, he kind of like, he, he kind of gives up his dreams for Luke, who later goes to save the galaxy. Yeah, that's an interesting. Take. That's an interesting take. Well, it's interesting because who later like, goes he puts, to doom the galaxy. <laughs> he puts a lot of pressure on Luke to like not have big dreams and not look to the stars, and I think that's a kind of interesting read. Is that Owen was this kind of young idealistic dreamer anyway we're giving the movies more credit than they probably deserve mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um yeah so that's Revenge of the Sith and that's the prequels that's all three of the prequels I mean I, I don't know if we touched on enough detail of the film itself like overall I'd say technically it's the most ambitious of all three of the films hmm I think story wise is the most ambitious as well. Yeah. Because it's trying to no, that's do true. so much. It's emotionally so much. emotionally it's by far the most ambitious. And, and it's also Although, no, I actually think two is the most ambitious because two is but, trying to tell a love story, which is one of the hardest kind of movies to make. I think it's one of 
I don't think it's that hard. To make an honest to God love story, like to make yeah. a story where you mm. actually believe two people have fallen in love, is really hard. I just think people name, have failed name to it. like two movies that you have seen recently that like. Oh, recently. Like Anyone? Empire works as a love story, but in part it's because of um, it's a new the hope. Acting. I said that's the acting. No, it's I think it's pre- I think it's pretty well written in Empire. The way yeah. that they develop their chemistry. Yeah. Because like, there's the bit where she falls in his lap and he doesn't let her go and he's like, don't get excited. And she's like... Yeah, but I feel like in in Revenge... Yeah. George kind of realised how little groundwork he had done to yes. set up the OT. As we've said with all these films, there's a huge amount of course correction. And then he like tried to like write everything in like yeah. really fast. Absolutely. And like that's why there's a lot of the film that it's just... There's a lot of dialogue scenes in, in Coruscant going back and forth with Anakin to different areas. Yes. So with talking Anakin, to the Jedi, talking to Palpatine, Palpatine and seeing, like, seeing like why the Jedi don't trust like him, they seeing try, why Palpatine is setting up him. a lot of Absolutely. stuff. And They're trying to catch up. It's cut. It's a lot of catch up. And it's like, it's, dude, you spend two movies, you set up the clones, you set up... Set up, up the clones. You set up the, the love story and that's all you did in two movies. And... Two of those things were in one of those films. Yes. It's like, come on. Like, he he had a lot of time to make these films. Well, thank like, God that Disney decided before making another trilogy to think out the whole trilogy and how everything would pay yes, off. Yes, I know, right? I know, right? Thank yeah. God they had, like, a plan and, like, it's all structured from the start. Oh, wait a second. Now, this is the end of the Lucas era of Star Wars after this film. Because, of course, six years after this film comes out, he sells Star Wars to Disney. Yeah. So, in a way... 2011? Mm-hmm. 2011 is when he sells I feel like it was 2011, maybe it was 20. I thought it was 13. Might be 13, yeah. So, I, I was, I, I was in Australia for a bit when it happened. Okay. And I arrived in 2011. So, yeah. I'm be. trying to remember what my reaction was. I think I was sort of like... I was happy. Really? I was happy when I saw that... The original cast wasn't in it. I wasn't because I already felt a little bit of the Disney owns everything virus. Like, because Studio Ghibli... Studio Ghibli was the first one for me where I was like, oh man, like, is that going to affect Ghibli? And then with Ponyo, I kind of felt like it was. And then Wind Rises, I felt a lot better. Um, Studio Ghibli is in a really tough place now with Hayao. He's coming out of retirement, but people are kind of questioning whether the studio can survive beyond him. Because um, Takahata and all these other incredible geniuses who work there, they haven't had the same kind of success. And there's other studios, of course, like um, Shinkai's got his studio that's taking off. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to Ghibli in a post Hayao Miyazaki world. But I'm so grateful that he's making another film. George Lucas should make another film. I really think so. I really want him to before he um, he passes on into to be a force ghost. I'd love to see what he'd do now. I know he's produced some weird little films like that um, that big magic film and Strange um, Magic. Strange Magic. I've never seen it. And uh, nope. Red Red Tails. Like, Red Tails. Yeah, I, I, I want. He's he's obviously involved with the next Indiana Jones. Is he? No, he's no, not because Lucasfilm purchased it. Yeah. Damn, that's right. He'll be involved in some capacity. He'll definitely mm. like. I don't know. We'll see. This is the last film he made. This is the last feature film he is credited as a director on. Yeah, he's the last film he's directed. Yes. Not made. But he's, only, he's only directed eight films? No, no. Um, no. Oh, five films. No. Right? THX. THX, American Graffiti. Graffiti. No, six. New Hope. Six. Six. And then the three. Where's yeah. the sixth? No, THX. THX. American THX. Graffiti. A New Hope. Oh, and yeah. Six. Yeah, six. I'm um, good. Me good. Mathematics. He directed a perfect six. Hey, you know what? I, you know how? <laughs> nope. Hey, you know how the other day we were talking about how a great director, like a legendary director, has directed ten masterpieces, and like Spielberg, Kurosawa, um, Scorsese, knocked that out of the park, no question. And then I was thinking about, but there's guys who made like five films that are master. Like I was thinking about Coppola. Like you've got Godfather, Godfather Two, Conversation, Apocalypse Now, Rainmaker, um, Rumblefish. You've got all these amazing films. There are some guys who haven't made 10 masterpieces. Like, Kubrick didn't. Kubrick made 10 films, but I wouldn't call every single one of them a masterpiece. He made at least eight that are, like, the greatest films of all time. Like, George Lucas, I think, made five of the greatest films ever made. Five? Yeah. Yeah. What is... THX, American Graffiti, New Hope. 
Phantom no, Menace: Revenge of the Sith. Don't do that. <laughs> no. Nope. Man, I wish these movies were better. I wish they were good. At least. Well, the next time we reconvene, we're going to be talking about a film directed by the man who George Lucas wanted to direct these films. And hilariously, he only ended up directing the next film because the other two directors, who are also weird young visionaries, were fired. So We're fired out of incompetence, I thought. I've heard so many conflicting stories. And given their track record, like, just think about this for a second. Yeah, no, do you really believe it. that? Do you really believe that? We'll talk about this next week. This is a huge part of what is interesting about the Disney era because both Rogue One and Solo have very similar experiences with the way that the directors are handled on the films. It is almost polar opposite to the way Force Awakens, Last Jedi, and from what I've heard, Rise of Skywalker have functioned in terms of the director's freedom on set. It's really insane, and I can't wait to talk about it next week. I, I just think I just think um, it's on the directors a lot more. We'll talk about the stories because I've got a lot of um, reading I've done on um, Chris Miller and Phil Lord and a lot I've done on Gareth Edwards and Tony Gilroy. But essentially, this is the end of the Lucas era and we're going to touch on it again, of course, with the original trilogy. Yeah. But this, these were the most expensive independently financed films of all time and some of the most successful ones. And given this age of Disney Star Wars, I do truly look back on the prequels and feel both a deep... A deep nostalgia for the time when one single creator was in charge of every aspect of this production, but also a deep appreciation for how difficult it is for somebody else to translate that vision into something cohesive. And, you know, people now like to say that the Disney films have destroyed Star Wars and that they're, you know, messes of films. They're a lot better than these films. Yeah. Like, my, The Last Jedi, which is my least favourite of the Disney films other than probably Solo... That film is much better than all the prequels. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, it might be. It actually might be. be I don't it know. is. These prequel it's films, everyone says, oh, well, it has that really interesting Puppetin story. <laughs> it's like, I it's hope we've disproven that. It's, it's barely on 